Good evening. Today is June 5th, uh, 2023. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much for being here uh, to join us both in person and online for the Burlington City Council meeting. The time is 6, 616. Um, before we uh, commence with our meeting, just would like to thank the three local partners of City Place, um, Dave Farrington, Scott Ireland, and Al Senecal, who I believe are here as well in person with us this evening, but also for the site visit that you hosted this evening for the City Council, as well as a number of Burlington and Chittenden County legislators. Uh, it was wonderful to see the site filled with activity and the work. Uh, my understanding is there's over 50 people that are working on the site every day. So certainly exciting to see all of this happening with steel set to arrive in July and give form to our buildings. And we're all looking forward to the housing that we're gonna have downtown. Um, so a heartfelt thanks to Dave, Al, and Scott for their, your commitment to this project and to our city. Um, with that, we'll begin our agenda this evening with uh, item 1.1, which is a motion to adopt our agenda. We do have some um, amendments to our agenda. Um, is there anyone who'd be willing to make that motion? Thank you so much, Councillor McGee. Please go ahead. I would move to amend and adopt the agenda as follows, to suspend the rules and amend the agenda to set public comment for 7.50 p.m., as well as to take up item two ahead of public comment. Uh, remove from the consent agenda item 6.29, First Amendment to Second Amended and Restated Development, uh, development Agreement, and place it on the deliberative agenda as agenda item 7.1, per City Council President Paul, per Councilors Bergman and Grant. Uh, add to the consent agenda item 6.31, Communication, Michael Long, re Police Chief Appointment. Add to the consent agenda item 6.32, Communication, Jennifer A. Francoeur. <laughs> Re BTV crime and council support for citizen safety through essential law enforcement. Thank you so much. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Uh, seconded by Councillor Jang. Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, our, that motion passes and we have an agenda. And with that, we move on to item number two, which is a resolution declaring June 15th, 2023 as Frozen Treat Day. Um, uh, I will go to Councillor Travers for a motion on this resolution. Uh, thank you, President Paul. I move to waive the reading and adopt the resolution and would ask for the floor back upon a second. Thank you so much. Uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Bergman. Uh, Councilor Travers, you have the floor. Thank you, President Paul. So it's uh, my great privilege to welcome uh, my family here this evening, including my daughter, Lola Travers, who's a second grader at Champlain Elementary in uh, the classroom of uh, Miss Jacqueline Patricio, uh, who's here this evening. Um, my wife and I, as part of Miss Patricio's curriculum, uh, went in for a, a, a career day. Um, and uh, the class was very much not interested in um, hearing about my career as a, my real career as a lawyer and much more interested in hearing about uh, the work we do here on the city council. Um, and uh, my wife who works for the legislature as well and I um, engaged the class in a legislative exercise uh, where we asked them to uh, choose something in our community that they would like to honor on a particular day and after uh, much debate on different options like a, a running day uh, or a say yes to kids day uh, or a everything, every uh, yeah, that's every day, um, or everything is free day. Um, the class ultimately, after, after much deliberation, um, settled on a frozen treat day. And um, if the council would oblige, I know we have a packed agenda this evening, but we do have Lola and, and Miss Patricio here this evening who uh, if, if I could um, yield the floor to them for a minute or two to explain why they landed on Frozen Treat Day, I think maybe it would be a good way to start our agenda this evening. Great, thank you. Um, please come and sit down, join us. You want to come forward, Lola? Oh, and um, yes, Lola's uh, second grade classmate, Calder Bird, is here as well. Um, and so, Calder, if you could come forward too, that'd be great. Calder's mom, Celia, was here recently um, in her role with the Board of Health. People may recognize Celia. 
and we have a future, uh, uh, no doubt, engaged Burlingtonian here in Calder and Lola as well. So Lola, if you want to hit the button in front of you uh, to make sure that light is green. green. Okay. Green. And if you want to talk just for a minute or two about why your class landed on honoring frozen treats. Okay. <laughs> um, well, my name is Lola Travers, and I'm a second grader in Miss Jackie's second grade class at Champlain Elementary School. And I'm here to support Frozen Treat Day. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Calder Bird. And I'm here to support Frozen. I think we should have Frozen Treat Day. Because <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Lola or Calder, could you say just maybe one thing each that yeah. you like about frozen treats? Okay. okay. Um, um, because, they're, because they're yummy and fun. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, I think it's a good idea because it's the end of the school year and it's a good, good way to start off summer with a good frozen treat. Also, I think it's a good idea because it's a good way to celebrate all our learning as we step onto another level of learning. And I think it also builds our community when we step together and have some like cold treats for fun. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, Lola and Calder. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Jackie, yes. I just wanted to say hello to all the counselors. Thank you so much for supporting this. And it's a great way to end our learning this year. We have a, um, a new curriculum program, a new literacy program that's been adopted for all the elementary schools. And our unit is jobs in our community. So this really brings a lot of real world learning for us. And that's super important for them. That's, that's what we know helps the learning stick. So um, I'm a big fan of Frozen Treat Day. It seems like it's accessible to all. It seems like a nice way that we can celebrate kids and all the hard work that they've done this year and um, start our summers off right. So thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, we can clap again. <laughs> thank you to all of you for coming, and thank you, Councillor Travers. Are there, are there any other councillors that wish to comment on the resolution before us? Um, seeing none, before we go to a vote, uh, Councillor Travers, perhaps you would want to amend your motion to request that a copy of the resolution when it is signed by the mayor suitable for framing be distributed to the class and sent to the teacher uh, I think that's a great suggestion and um, I am friendly to that amendment if Councillor Bergman is as well uh, the grandfather in the crowd is is totally in favor of that of, of, of that amendment um, seeing seeing no other comments from counselors will go to a vote all those in favor of the resolution um, as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please don't say no. <laughs> the motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much to Councillor Travers, to the second grade class at Champlain Elementary, parents and teachers for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is a work session, which is item number three, a work session on plan for homelessness and exiting the motel voucher program. Um, I believe we do have a number of presenters that are here this evening. Um, with that, I'll hand the work session over to the mayor for the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, President Paul. Um, in a moment, uh, I am going to ask Sarah Russell, our special assistant, 
for ending homelessness and Samantha Dunn, our assistant director for community works to really uh, uh, lead a, a, a presentation that will sh share with uh, the council what um, and with the public what we where we are in this in this effort I will say since the last time we talked about this issue with the council three weeks ago uh, there has been a significant um, a, a lot has changed uh, the legislative session ended with um, some clarity about resources that would be available to help with the transition of the uh, mo end of the motel program, that budget was then vetoed, um, uh, leaving there some some question as to the status of those resources. But we are moving forward, uh, confident that they will, um, in some fashion, be made available. And the city was, along with other organizations and municipalities, formally invited by the state, by the Agency of Human Services, the Department of Children and Families, to be part of um, responding to the ending of, of the, the motel program. And what the city team has settled on and has been working hard on um, in the, since May 22nd, when that formal invitation was issued by the DEC, um, breaks down into three areas. There are two of the areas are actions that the city has submitted now a letter of intent um, to pursue if we can secure state funding for, which will involve the opening of a, uh, a third 50-bed congregate shelter in downtown Burlington, as well as an additional day station facility so that uh, people who are unsheltered will have access to services um, during, during the day and during the period when the congregate shelter, at the hours when it's expected to be closed. And then the third action um, is something that Burlington is doing in partnership with 26 other members of the Chittenden County Alliance, uh, Home Homelessness Alliance. Um, we are expecting a vote later this week, a formal vote following um, a couple weeks of discussion with lead agencies in the coalition to endorse um, an alternative plan for the, uh, the second phase of hotel exits that are currently expected for the end of July. That too is something that has shifted even in the time since we last talked and that that, uh, that second deadline wh which was expected to be July 1 until last week has been moved back to July 28th. What we, um, what you'll hear in this presentation is a proposal to extend that further um, with a commitment from the Alliance to be focus all of its resources on uh, housing the 165 high need households that are uh, expected to lose their housing currently at the end of uh, July that we with we are proposing an extension and a funded extension by the state transition dollars accompanied with this coalition effort to house approximately 25 households a month through our coordinated entry system that projection, that goal is not uh, kind of taken out of thin air. That is the, what, what the coordinated entry system has been uh, consistently producing over the last quarter. Um, and uh, there's good reason to expect with the new units that are coming online in the months ahead and the uh, general functioning of that system that it is, uh, it is a uh, an output that we can plan around. And with that, with that, um, we could responsibly end this program um, uh, in approximately five to eight months beyond the, the current projected date. At the end of July, it would be, it, we, we believe this is a feasible, affordable, and humane alternative to the one that has been put forward currently um, uh, by the state. And um, we're excited to kind of share, share our thinking in more detail. I'll just hand it over in one moment. The one last thing I'd like to say is, as you hear this presentation, um, I hope you will, um, and you reflect on the actions that we've taken together over the last couple of years with respect to homelessness. Um, it, to me is uh, really um, reassuring that we have 
uh, I guess basically I am thankful that we have together been able to take the steps that we have. It is hard to imagine how we would be getting through this crisis if we didn't have a special assistant on homelessness who is leading the effort, if we hadn't opened together over 85 low barrier uh, shelter beds in the city of Burlington, um, going from a place where we had zero low barrier shelter beds before that, if we had not together appropriated the money to um, open the Elmwood Avenue shelter, um, and if we had not focused so much of our efforts on, on housing production um, that it, it is uh, leading to some of the units that are coming online, um, and finally, if we had not invested in the coordinated entry system that is going to make this, uh, this plan possible, we'd be in a, just a very different, much more challenging place than we are today. So we've come a long way together on this issue already. We have some challenging months ahead, but I think this is a plan to get us through it. And um, with that, I uh, would like to welcome Sarah and Samantha to lead the presentation. Uh, so we prepared a slide uh, for you tonight that we'll walk through that will detail um, some of the work that we've been doing over the, it feels like a much longer period of time, but it's really just been a matter of a couple of weeks uh, since things have changed. Um, so here are some brief updates. The mayor went through most of these in his um, opening remarks. Um, since the May 15th city council meeting when the resolution was um, approved by you all, we have taken a lot of steps and a lot of things have changed. Um, CEDO and the Agency of Human Services are now um, convening regular meetings with municipalities across Chittenden County, um, in addition to service providers and emergency responders um, as we we're looking forward to this June 1st deadline and now as we look forward to the um, July 28th deadline. Um, CEDO continues to convene regular meetings with outreach providers um, to understand what's happening on the ground, what they're seeing in terms of folks primarily who are unsheltered. Um, those outreach providers also include a group who go into motels, um, so they're not just serving uh, folks who are outside and unsheltered, but also working with people in, mot in the motel system. Um, we worked closely with AHS leadership to understand the scope of our challenges. We obtained data from um, economic services about the uh, households who were in motels um, and looking at the two waves of folks who um, are exiting motels to understand more about what their needs might be. Uh, we have also held, uh, the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance held an extraordinary steering committee meeting on May 26th um, in response to um, the request for letters of uh, interest uh, from the Agency of Human Services to understand what agencies were um, seeing as gaps and what they might uh, submit an LOI around. And I'm going to talk a little more about that in a couple minutes. Um, we also uh, pulled together city department leadership, including CEDO, uh, Parks, Rec, and Waterfront, uh, the city attorney's office, the police department, and the mayor's office to define our staff roles around the camping response uh, within the city. And um, the city attorney's office has begun updates uh, to the sheltering on public lands policy to reflect uh, current practice and the um, expansion of support staff that we have um, within the city. The Policy previously referred to was, to my understanding, drafted at a time when um, the uh, CSL team was not in existence, um, and we certainly have built a more robust um, support offering um, to folks who are unsheltered in the city. Uh, and last but not least, we submitted um, a letter of interest, um, as the mayor mentioned, to um, AHS uh, right on that uh, June 1st deadline. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of data here um, around the motel program. And for those who are not as familiar with the motel program, for the, the who haven't been breathing it for the last, <laughs> last few months, um, in an effort to limit the spread of COVID, the state utilized federal um, funding to expand the emergency motel program. Federal funding for this program has been fully expended, and in March, the Agency of Human Services announced that the program would end in two waves, as we mentioned. Um, Economic Services runs an Adverse Weather Conditions, or AWC, program from December 15th um, through May March 15th. Excuse me. This program this year was extended to June 1st. And in Chittenden County, uh, 170 households moved out of motels that encompassed 194 
individual people. Um, none of those were children um, that were included in that um, first wave. Uh, we will see the second wave of motel program closures or exits on, Jan on July 28th. This is an extension um, from the July 1st uh, exit date that was originally proposed. Uh, I think in part because of some of the um, really kind of amazing advocacy, especially on behalf of the city um, to AHS leadership um, resulted in this extension. Uh, in the second wave, we anticipate seeing 184 households exit motels. That includes 318 people total. Um, this includes uh, more vulnerable populations, which is really concerning. Um, so in this wave, we're including 56 families with 115 children, 15 people who are 65 years old and older, 92 people with disabilities, 20 people receiving home health and or hospice services, two pregnant people, and four households fleeing domestic violence. Those four households that are fleeing domestic violence um, have been referred to the domestic violence motel pool that's operated locally by Steps to End Domestic Violence um, and will not need to exit their motels um, at this time. So on June 1st, I wanted to provide an update. Um, that was just Friday. It feels like a lot longer ago now. Um, in response to the June 1st motel exits, the community responded in a number of ways, including deploying outreach teams in a coordinated effort across the county to connect households both on June 1st and in the days leading up um, to the exits. They conducted planning for where people would go when the program ended. Uh, according to both anecdotal and quantitative data, nearly 60% of the households that exited on June 1st did not have a plan or had a plan which included camping or sleeping in a car. Many were hoping to enter a shelter program that existed. However, with all shelters in Chittenden County at max capacity, this was likely to not be an option. Um, storage solutions will need to be generated as people with uh, people exiting had all of their belongings with them and had nowhere to go and nothing to do with their items. Um, so we're working on this with CVOEO right now um, and hope to have some storage options available soon. Uh, CEDO, in partnership with the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, created a resource guide with all available bathroom and showers across the city. Um, we had a great deal of support with Parks and Rec, Rec Department on that. Um, in addition, um, uh, there were resources for food and meals and tents and camping supplies are provided in this guide. Um, copies of that guide are available here tonight for anyone who um, needs them. They're also available um, in the first ground floor of uh, City Hall and um, at the CEDO front desk as well. Um, some people found, um, overall the exits last week um, were largely as we expected. Some people found temporary options uh, with friends or family. Some utilized um, a portion or some part of a $3,000 security deposit um, to extend a most motel stay. Some are camping and some are in cars and we're continuing to gauge the impact this week. Um, on an anecdotal note, uh, just to kind of detail some of the challenges around the exits and uh, part of what makes the July 28th uh, date even more confusing uh, or, or confusing, concerning, uh, one hotel in Colchester uh, which housed over 50 households decided to exit all of the guests. Um, under their program, so even the households that could have stayed until July 28th uh, were exited and provided a notice on Friday that they had to leave. This caused a lot of confusion and worry for people because they were not expecting to exit on this date. And among the 18 households that could have stayed until July 28th but were exited, two were very vulnerable and receiving home health services. Um, so a real strong group effort needed to come in to help to relocate um, all of those 18 households, but especially those two. Um, they were shifted to another motel, um, but the unplanned exit caused the teams to have to sh shift really rapidly. So on July 28th, um, we will see the next round of folks leave motels. 
Um, on May 22nd, as we said earlier, AHS received a memo requesting letters of interest to respond to the motel exits. Um, there was an incredibly tight turnaround on this. Uh, the deadline for the LOIs was June 1st, although we've heard that that'll be a rolling deadline from this point forward um, for other folks to, to submit um, recommendations. Um, on May 26th, as I said, the CHA, uh, CCHA, or Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, um, held an extraordinary community meeting that was attended by nearly 90 participants. I actually think many of you um, city councilors were uh, part of that meeting as well. Um, and uh, we learned more about the data for the households that are exiting um, on now June 28th. Um, we also heard presentation uh, from AHS uh, around the request for LOIs and learned how agencies were preparing to respond. CVOEO, Burlington Housing Authority, Pathways, and Champlain Housing Trust submitted LOIs to expand outreach and training for staff to support meals and food distribution efforts, to increase case management capacity for permanent supportive housing, and to expand transitional units for vulnerable households. Um, in addition, as you know, the City of Burlington submitted an LOI, um, as did the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, um, to expand overnight and daytime shelter and advocate for motel extension for vulnerable households. So the, this slide really um, su summarizes our efforts. Um, we have a robust concentration of resources, um, including state agencies, community health centers, public transportation, substance use, and mental health providers, and nonprofit organizations um, that support basic needs um, within Burlington. So we expect to shoulder the bulk of the challenge caused by uh, the set enclosure of the state motel program. Our community proposes a three-pronged approach, which the mayor talked about um, in his opening, that includes the expansion of emergency shelter capacity, expansion of daytime shelter options for people, and advocacy for motel program extension for vulnerable households with a streamlined and tightly coordinated effort to rapidly house those in motels over the next five to eight months. Budget projections for the overnight and daytime shelters are here on this slide um, and are based on estimated costs associated with capital investment, staffing, shelter and office supplies, food and basic necessities for guests. Uh, it's important to note we have not um, received uh, building plans or um, been able to, to inspect uh, the property that um, we're considering at this time. So um, those are estimates, especially around the capital costs. Um, the budget projections for extending the motel stay are between 1.7 and 2 million and are dependent on availability of housing resources over the next five to eight months. So going into a little bit more detail, um, the, first, uh, the first piece of the city's letter of intent was to expand emergency congregate shelter. Um, we submitted this LOI with a focus on, um, first of all, acknowledging a lack of um, shelter capacity within the city and an influx of folks who are coming into motels. Um, in a, with the overnight uh, semi-congregate shelter will accommodate up to 50 guests. We propose using the largely vacant state office building located at 108 Cherry Street due to its proximity to resources, services, and transportation. And while best practice indicates non-congregate shelter is ideal in most cases, this building would allow the offices to be used uh, for shelter accommodations for up to one to four individuals, um, planning space for staff, and an on-site daytime shelter available to the community for up to 75 people. While the budget provided um, on the previous slide is annualized, the shelter is expected to operate until the adverse weather conditions go back into effect um, in early December. Um, the guests who are remaining um, in the shelter at that time will transition into motels under the AWC or adverse, <laughs> adverse weather conditions at that time. Um, and the city, due to overtaxed um, community agencies and a lack of um, staffing capacity, the city has considered working with a staffing agency to ensure safe, sta safe ratios between staff and guests on site. 
um, and we are in close communication with Agency of Human Services um, and have not yet received confirmation um, that this location is approved, but they are in the process of um, going through health and safety inspections um, at that building right now. The next uh, step here is around the co-located um, daytime shelter. Um, the budget that we submitted um, along with our LOI includes both overnight and daytime shelter, staff, case management, meals, and resources on site. CVOEO, uh, the operator of the daytime shelter, um, the community resource center that is uh, located at Feeding Chittenden, reports up to 160 visitors to their location in a day. Um, our concern and their concern as well is that with people exiting the motels, this could cause an overflow of guests at that location. Um, therefore, a secondary daytime location is being proposed. Um, and this daytime shelter will be open during weekends as well um, as during the week and would serve as an additional cooling center in summer months. Um, partnerships for medical recovery and harm reduction supports will be pursued as well, um, utilizing the same supportive model uh, that we've been able to build over at the Elmwood shelter. Before I talk about the, um, the last uh, point of advocacy, um, I wanted to give a brief overview of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance for those who weren't familiar. Um, the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, or CCHA, is our local continuum of care and is comprised of stakeholders including social service and housing agencies, community members, and people with lived experience of homelessness or housing insecurity from across Chittenden County. In addition to the city's LOI, the CCHA, um, as well as other partner agencies, have submitted LOIs to the motel program. And I serve as one of the two co-chairs for the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, and I'm also the co-chair of the Strategic Planning Committee for um, the Homeless Alliance. So I also want to provide a quick overview of coordinated entry, just to make sure that we all have a common um, understanding of what that means. Um, coordinated entry is required by HUD of all communities that receive federal funding for homeless services and rental assistance. At its core, coordinated entry provides a streamlined access to housing resources, including assessment, case management, or housing navigation, as we call it here locally, uh, rental assistance, and homeless dedicated units. We are in the early process of incorporating prevention efforts into coordinated entry as well. Coordinated entry ensures equity and allows us to report on the county and systems-wide data and utilization. Once enrolled, a household is connected to housing navigation services and progresses through the system, ending with a hopeful exit to permanent housing. All households are reviewed via a data sharing agreement by frontline staff and a week, at a weekly community housing review committee where case consultation and a matching of housing resources occurs. So the CCHA, um, oh, next slide. Uh, the CCHA submitted a letter of interest on behalf of um, the providers in Chittenden County um, to, uh, is pending our final approval, um, sorry, I should say, is pending final approval on June 8th. Uh, we do have a community uh, steering committee meeting this week on June 8th, um, but wanted to make the June 1st deadline uh, for the letter of, intent, or of interest, so that was submitted ahead of this meeting. Um, the basis of the LOI largely advocates for extension of the motel stay for vulnerable households that we mentioned on the first uh, slide and proposes we will closely collaborate with housing and service providers to prioritize resources leading to rapid housing placements in permanent or transitional housing for the households in motels. Data indicates, as the mayor mentioned, that we are able to house an average of 25 households per month through our coordinated entry system, in addition to expediting motel exits to permanent housing. As part of this countywide collaboration, the Howard Center has agreed to prioritize these uh, vulnerable households in motels for mental health and substance use services. Within the LOI, we request funding for a full-time staff person uh, within the Homeless Alliance to manage this process, coordinate all of the work of the case managers, and work directly with housing providers to match households with appropriate housing resources, including available units, rental subsidy, and retention services when necessary. Uh, we estimate if AHS agrees to extend the motel stays in the manner that we are proposing that we can house uh, the 165 households from the motel program 
by February of 2024. Um, this last slide here talks about really highlights, um, well, we talk about problems a lot. I don't think we highlight the hard work that we do and uh, the progress that we make to housing, um, to, to housing folks in Chittenden County. Um, so this slide shows um, that, ch that coordinated entry has supported 166 households exiting homelessness into permanent housing. Um, in the first quarter of 2023, um, we have been able to house 81 households um, in permanent housing, uh, which is pretty impressive considering the lack of resources, um, staffing capacity, and um, really tight um, housing market. The spikes that you see here on this graph indicate uh, when a new housing development comes online. So you can see you know, exactly when that happens. Um, the, um, in December, you can see there that Zephyr Place, which is a Champlain Housing Trust property, opened and enabled 38 uh, households to access permanent housing from homelessness. Um, and according to planned development throughout Chittenden County, we anticipate a total of 112 homeless dedicated units to open. So for these units, or for these reasons, we need to coordinate exits from the motels so vulnerable households can transition directly into permanent housing. Um, we just need the time and resources to be able to do that. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Sarah. I think uh, we'd open it up for questions from the council in a moment. I just, before doing that, I just want to make sure a couple points are, are clear to everyone. From our perspective, from the perspective um, of the alliance, the uh, governor's current plan to uh, turn out 165 Chittenden County high need households and offer only congregate shelters as an option is not an acceptable uh, outcome. It, it, I think, I you know we have a lot of parents here uh, at, at the table here. Um, if you Anyone who's raised a kid, I think, if you think about the idea of raising children for weeks to months, which is explicitly the current uh, administration plan, uh, raising kids for weeks to months in a congregate shelter with um, many others is just not, not, not a, uh, it's just, it would be a desperate scene and something that um, we can avoid through this alternative, which is affordable, which is feasible, um, and which we can deliver on. And when I say we there, I wanna make sure, again, this is not the city by any means alone, although with Sarah, we're, we, we are gonna support this effort as, uh, uh, greatly. This is an effort that would be done in partnership with the other 26 agencies that are part of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. We expect, again, a vote later this week to commit the coordinated entry system to focus on this population. There's also been commitments by um, other agencies to fo focus other resources beyond the coordinated entry system to supporting these households. Uh, so this is, this is an alternative plan that we think um, uh, is, is, is a much better way to go. And we would welcome the council's endorsement of this different direction. I think it's, it would be great if the city could be speaking with one voice um, that this is uh, a better outcome. And um, we have this very rare and unusual situation where we're joined tonight by many members of the state legislature. We appreciate your attention to this issue. We appreciate you being here. And it would be great if, and I, and I know many of you share the concern about the current direction. Of, of the program and it is, um, it is certainly our hope that somehow we can work together over the coming weeks to uh, get to this uh, much better outcome um, than what we're currently on a trajectory for. So thank you, President Paul. I, uh, again, we'd be happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Mayor, and uh, thank you as well, uh, Sarah, Samantha, and also to Marcella. Um, uh, quite, an, quite an amazing report. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. I'm sure there must be some questions. You put a lot of information at us. Um, uh, are there any questions or comments from the council? Uh, Councillor Grant. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the information. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I have a couple of questions regarding the numbers when we say um, Chittenden County households. There are, uh, from my understanding, a number of people um, who would consider their quote unquote home base to be Chittenden County, but were housed in Rutland County because that's where rooms were available. Are they included in your numbers or would they be separate? And if they're separate, do you have a way to track them? That's a really good question and one that we have been working to uh, really pressing uh, economic services to share more um, with us. Um, these numbers that we presented tonight represent the households that are in motels within Chittenden County. Um, it is our understanding that due to motel, lack of motel capacity in Chittenden County that as many as 70 households needed to be placed out of county. However, um, economic services let us know that they did not track who those households were. Mm. Um, so we have, like I said, been <laughs> advocating for that information for uh, over a year now um, and it's not information that we can find. Uh, we anticipate that at least some of those families will, or households, will return to Chittenden County, but we're unsure um, what that number might look like. Okay, so th these totals might change depending on these um, totals, communication. Yeah, these totals are changing all the time. Yeah. So um, this data is actually from uh, May 19th. Um, and will continue to change. People enter and exit the motel system every day. So um, we continue to advocate for updated data from economic services so that we can plan accordingly. Okay, thank you so much. So there's a lot of information. I also uh, checked out the press conference, so I got some more of it as well. Um, I did not notice today, is this uh, presentation being attached to the agenda? Are we gonna? Sure. Get, okay, great, thank you so much. And then I had a question because we had previously a major concern about camping. So we've got a lot of great information. We see a lot of great work being done, um, but we know that frontline agencies are providing sleeping bags and tents. We know that camping had already started. Um, what is happening there. I know it was a very controversial suggestion about the consideration of reviewing city lands where we could direct people to camp so that we could keep our uh, city parks available to residents and visitors and avoid what happened last year, if at all possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that we are continuing to assess that. Um, as I mentioned, I know I gave you a lot of information tonight. So as I mentioned, um, in the presentation, some people were um, eligible to receive up to a $3,000 security deposit um, that, what, that AHS put on the motel room. And so some of those folks could use that to extend their motel stay if that was possible or to find alternative um, accommodations. I think with the exits on Friday um, and today's Monday, we don't have a whole lot of information, um, but we do have a meeting scheduled with the outreach providers on Wednesday this week to understand more of what they're seeing. So in some ways, I think it's a little bit early for us to tell to be able to, I, to, be able to give you a real accurate view of, of what we're seeing for folks who are unsheltered. Councilor Grant, I would just add to that the, this proposal is um, consistent with um, the administration's position that uh, tent sanctioned camping, camping is not a real solution to the homelessness challenge that we're facing. The part of the reason we are um, offering to lead this effort to expand the congregate shelter uh, to, to add an additional, a third new congregate shelter since the start of the pandemic is so that we can expand the capacity of the current system um, and avoid, if there are, we, we certainly are expecting as a result of the end of this program, there to be more unsheltered people. We wanna get this congregate shelter started as quickly as possible. Um, as, and we are working with the state to, and there has been quite a bit of back and forth. Uh, the idea here would be that this shelter would um, replace, would, it be, would be a response to it, it would address these, the additional pressures on, um, on camping on city lands. 
Thank you. Um, with uh, the utmost respect, I never said it was a solution. As a matter of fact, I believe I went to great lengths in the previous meeting uh, to express that uh, don't believe that camping um, is a but anywhere near a permanent uh, housing solution in any way, shape, or form. But it is something that people have felt that they needed to do. It was a major issue uh, the last two summers, especially last summer. It has raised a lot of concern in the city with um, residents and visitors wanting to be able to use our parks. Uh, we had families come and talk about issues when they started Little League uh, that they found in some of the parks. And so I think that we have to be real and we have to um, be prepared to address some of this so that we can uh, control certain things such as disposal of garbage, people using toilets, um, disposal of needles for those that are dealing with uh, substance abuse disorders. I just think to say that it's not gonna happen when it's already happening, I think we really need to seriously um, be looking at that and just saying, well, what are we going to do? Are we gonna have this whack-a-mole game that we all talked about that happens? You move them, you say, you gotta move, can't stay here, then they go to another park, you gotta move, you can't stay here, then they go to another park. It, it's not, um, there needs to be something different. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Grant. Uh, we'll go to Councilor Travers and then Councilor Hightower to be followed by Councilor Carpenter. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, and uh, Sarah and Samantha, thank you very much for this presentation. It was uh, really much more than I, I was actually expecting when we asked you to come uh, before us a couple weeks ago on June 5th. And so I think you're, uh, and Marcella as well, owed a great deal of credit as well as uh, you, Mayor, for um, the extensive work uh, that you've done here in, in preparing for um, uh, what may be to come here. And Sarah, I'm very glad that we um, stood up your position as well. I think uh, we're, we're very grateful to have you uh, here with the city, so thank you very much. Um, I have a couple comments which you can read as questions if you have an answer to it, but if you don't have an answer to it, that's uh, totally fine as well. Um, so one of the comments is, um, first of all, I, I do want to be mindful about and careful about not um, conflating sort of certain behaviors with folks who will be utilizing uh, the proposed congregate shelters, but I also know that we have some experience with, for example, when there was a daytime congregate shelter on South Winooski Avenue, there being some concerns there in such a way that the folks that were hosting that uh, congregate shelter did not sort of renew that, moving it forward. I'm mindful of the fact that 108 Cherry Street is right outside of um, the city's transit center, which we've heard uh, as a council leading up to today, um, concerns about you know, some of the activities taking place in the transit center. And so I suppose my first comment is to the extent you are exploring the staffing needs of 108 Cherry Street itself um, within the building, whether or not you know, we're also considering what potential additional staffing needs are outside the building, particularly at the transit center, particularly uh, uh, during um, school drop-off and pick-up in particular. And again, if you have an answer to that now, you can feel that, uh, feel that as a question, but that was one comment that I had. I guess at this point how I would answer that is um, that I think that the, the model of um, neighborhood oversight that we've implemented at the Elmwood Shelter could be successful in this location as well. So um, we have certainly increased uh, presence of CSOs in the area um, and BPD. In addition, uh, shelter staff are, um, are also sort of going outside the immediate Elmwood Shelter property um, to check in with guests um, and other folks. If there are guests there, you know, welcoming them back to the shelter and, um, and sort of being a, a staff presence within that neighborhood. Great, and uh, I, I do think significant improvements have been made on the city's end uh, since there was a shelter housed uh, at South Winooski Avenue, including the items that you just discussed there. And so uh, again, credit due um, to the work that's been done there to make uh, the Elmwood Avenue community be such a success. Um, 
My other comment is, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously as Burlington's biggest city, I think more responsibility falls on us than some of our surrounding communities. But I'm curious whether or not outside of um, the CCHA, um, the extent to which uh, we have been hearing from or talking to or coordinating with uh, municipalities around Burlington and whether or not we're familiar with uh, any steps that they are taking at this point in time to uh, really step up to the plate to address this in the same way that uh, you all have put together here from Burlington Stance. Sure, so the CCHA is encompass encompasses all of Chittenden County, um, not just in Burlington, so um, we have you know, membership from other uh, towns and municipalities outside. Uh, we have been hosting um, weekly meetings at this point um, in partnership with the Agency of Human Services um, with leadership from each of those municipalities and emergency responders um, to understand what, what their response might be. Um, to date, uh, they have not indicated uh, that they are, um, that, that they're opening any kind of shelter capacity within their towns. Um, we have heard from the city of Winooski that they are exploring some options around um, a temporary congregate shelter as well, um, but no, nothing, nothing concrete to, to share on that. Um, I'll also say that um, I asked the Agency of Human Services this morning when we were on a call, I wanted to know, you know what they were seeing in response to the LOIs and they were hesitant to provide any specific details, um, said they were still reviewing them, but statewide they did receive 44 uh, letters of interest from across the state. And I would just add to that that Sarah and I will be in Montpelier Wednesday um, presenting to the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force a kind of a blueprint of setting up Elmwood and we, Elmwood, um, we know there's folks in that community and several other communities that will be there that are very close um, to doing this were put in touch with us by pallet shelters and so we're hopeful that um, we're putting together a robust presentation and making ourselves available to answer questions will allow other communities to take the step that Burlington um, took with Elmwood and um, we know there's a lot of interest in that model as well. Great. Um, I, I appreciate that. I think as we mentioned in the resolution we passed at our last meeting, uh, this is not just a Burlington issue. This is really a, a regional crisis. And so I hope our surrounding uh, cities and towns and municipalities will also be stepping up to the plate to uh, respond to this crisis. Again, greatly appreciate your presentation. And um, it, it has my full support as you've laid it out here. So thank you. Can President Paul, if I could just uh, quickly respond to Councillor Travis's point as well. I just want to be clear, the city has explicitly taken the position and the conversations with AHS that um, uh, we think more than one congregate shelter, we, think, we don't think these 50 congregate beds are sufficient for the additional um, pressure, the additional need as a result of the ending of the program. While the city is willing to come to the kit table and be a key partner in the opening with state resources of another shelter, we think it's important that, the, that that not be the only congregate shelter and that the second or third facility um, happen uh, in other municipalities. And we've been consistent on that, and uh, I think HS understands that position and has voiced some um, acknowledgement uh, of it. And I have been encouraged of, uh, just to echo what Sarah says. I've talked directly with the mayor of Winooski and know that they are seriously considering a couple options there as well. So I, the sentiment you express is one that we share and have been consistently expressing in these conversations. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Travers. We'll go to Councillor Hightower to be followed by Councillor Carpenter. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just had one question for a number that I didn't catch that wasn't on this line. Is what percent did you say we're planning on camping, car camping, or didn't have a plan other than shelters? That was 60%, okay. um, but again, that's not that, we, have, we don't have a way of know that. Um, I do know that there was some surveying done of households who were exiting last week uh, by outreach workers, and I don't yet, because that wasn't complete by the end of Friday, I don't yet have the data, but um, that's something that we, that we hope to have early this Great. week. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm definitely glad <laughs> that we've got more of a plan forming than we had two weeks ago for the last council meeting. Um, 
I guess the thing is, you know, I'm glad that we have a plan, especially for the 165 high need individuals. That's not a plan for the other 347 non high need individuals. So it sounds like our plan for that right now is the 50 congregate shelter, 75 day, day shelter. Um, I, I think I just also want to point out that as much as this is a regional problem, like just looking at the population of Burlington versus Chittenden County, that doesn't even mean we're doing our kind of share yet of um, the folks who aren't high need. Um, and I think that that, and I think I just have to, if folks haven't seen Brenda like, Siegel's work on this, I think just like bringing home that these are very real people that the motel program has done so much for giving people stability, helping them find jobs, helping them get healthy, and to undo all of that in a few months is just a very painful thing um, to watch. And again, just like looking at the numbers, I'm obviously supportive of this. I think that that's not, it's not a, com so I guess my long term, like my big comment on it is, we, this isn't solving the majority, it's not even taking our kind of share of folks that need to, that we need to take care of in Burlington, which means we're gonna see an increase in camping. Um, right now, we know from what we've seen, that means a decrease in quality in life for the people who are camping. That means a decrease in quality in life for, and work-life balance for our city staff. That means a decrease in quality of life for our other constituents. And so maintaining our status quo of how we're treating campers right now just doesn't feel, given what we're looking at, like a, it, it seems like an awful idea. I'm not gonna say it doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, and then at the same time, if we do make it, like recognizing that anybody who is camping, we need an exit strategy. Like that, like we say, that is a short-term answer. That is not a long-term solution. And so it takes a lot of strategy and leadership to support some of those short-term answers without making them long-term solutions. And while I assume my plea is kind of falling on deaf ears with this administration, I think that's absolutely what we need to do is make camping more humane in the city because we know it's gonna be happening. The second thing is I think same thing with the shelter. I'm really glad to see this happen, even if it is just the 50 folks. Um, and then I think, again, I think we're gonna quickly have to come up with a strategy to make sure that doesn't become a long-term solution. Um, we don't wanna just increase shelter capacity and then be like, well, now, <laughs> now we have this many more beds. Um, and so I think continuing to work on what the long-term solution is. And that kind of brings me to my final point which is a little bit of like financial responsibility. And I just, I'm really, like we all know that this is a crisis. We all know that this is a policy decision. We all know that this is something that um, collectively we have the money to fix. And so I'm just very frustrated by the, you know, state going, oh, well, the federal government's not paying it anymore, so we can't do it. And the city's saying, well, this is really the state responsibility or regional responsibility. It's like, we all have to pony up the money. Like, we all have to be part of implementing the solution. And so I think another ask that I have is that the next budget reflects not just through federal money, but also if we need to, like, through our, which I, we will, I guess, is we all need to pony up, like, through our own funding deciding. What, what are we prioritizing? What are we saying morally when we're prioritizing other city spending over solutions on just housing people and doing a housing first model? Um, and I think I'll leave it there, but I think if we're only paying for short-term solutions and we're not paying for um, folks transitioning out of houselessness, then I, I and we're just waiting for the motel program to start up again in December, we're still failing. We're not giving folks the stability that they need. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hightower. We'll go to Councillor Carpenter and then to Councillor McGee. Thanks. Um, some of my questions um, been asked and Councillor Travers really talked about the regional impact and I, I just wanna reiterate and it is disappointing that we're not hearing more res direct responses from some of the communities about setting up shelters. They too have lots of public land and so I just encourage CCHA to push and the state to whatever degree they can push on that and to whatever degree the state has assets in those communities. Um, I was gonna specifically ask how 
firm we are at 108 Cherry Street and what the timeline is for that. Um, are we pretty certain about that? And then, of course, the staffing for that. Um, it sounds like you're going to try to contract externally for that, but do you have real live bidders or organizations that will actually be able to come to the table for that? Uh, so in addition to the uh, LOI uh, request memo that um, AHS released, um, they also released uh, request for proposals from uh, staffing agencies who would be able to staff shelters because uh, lack of shelter staff is something that we're seeing statewide and not just mm. in Chittenden County. Um, so, that, so that is in the process of happening uh, right now um, and hopefully they'll receive some uh, proposals that are feasible um, and then connect uh, the bid winners with, um, with local communities. Um, in the meantime, um, CEDO staff have met with um, an out-of-state um, staffing company that provides staffing. Um, they, they provide nursing staff um, here in Vermont, and they also uh, will be, I believe, providing the staffing uh, for the new psychiatric facility in northeastern Vermont as well. Um, they seem confident that they can fill the positions. Um, so. I, I can't predict, you know, uh, what what uh, what what turnout might be for those positions, but um, we can't we wouldn't be able to open anything unless we were fully staffed, um, just for safety reasons. Um, and regarding your question around 108 Cherry, um, we don't have any further information than what I've shared. Um, we are in um, really regular routine uh, communication. Um, with the state around um, the outcome of their health and safety inspections for that location. Has the Alliance done any kind of, and the municipalities survey of kind of other additional options there might be out in the greater Burlington area? In terms of locations? Yes. Um, yeah, so we met with, when I met with the Agency of Human Services um, and their emergency management director, they have some um, locations to consider. Um, none of them are, from looking at the list, it, was, there, it, wasn't, it wasn't super impressive. <laughs> um, a lot of them were just, uh, you know, the Sears building in South Burlington or the Hannaford you know, um, old Hannaford property um, in South Burlington or the fairgrounds, which is not feasible during the summer to host a shelter. So um, there weren't a lot of options um, for folks, um, especially because it needs to be in close proximity to services and transportation uh, for people who would utilize the shelter. So it really limited the, um, the options, but that was an exercise that we did. Just one more comment. I'll address this really to the, um, our colleagues in the legislature. I was sat in on the meeting with a fellow from um, Vermont Emergency Management who did a very good job in presentation. But I think he said something like, I just got assigned this last week. And so we have an emergency management agency and this sh should be on their docket. So I'm not addressing this to anybody personally, but so it took me aback that he just got this in his lap a couple of weeks ago. Thanks very much, Councilor Carpenter. We'll now go to Councilor McGee to be followed by Councilor Jang. Thank you, President Paul, and thank you, Sarah and Samantha and Marcella for all of the work that you all have been uh, putting in. I, you know, I think this is something that we all sort of saw coming uh, earlier in the legislative process with the way the budget was um, playing out, and I, I think it was something that up until the budget passed, we had hoped we wouldn't have to face. Um, and so the fact that we're here having this conversation tonight is uh, disheartening. Um, our budgets are moral documents, and the fact that uh, a decision has been made to unshelter uh, so many people, uh, thousands of people in the state is um, you know, the fact that we're left to cobble together what little resources we can find to support folks in what we all know is not the most ideal way. Uh, the fact that service organizations are handing out tents and sleeping bags, 
the fact that folks that might receive a tent or a sleeping bag were going to struggle with finding a place to put that and face the reality of that might possibly get stolen, that their personal belongings might get stolen. Um, I really think, you know, this comment is more for any of the public that are watching. Uh, the precarity that so many folks are facing living outside is uh, really not to be taken lightly. Um, and, you know, I'm glad to hear that so much has come together, that we are pursuing this plan for additional uh, shelter beds. Um, I think we all, uh, a lot of us are aware that people, some people choose to camp rather than a attempt to go to a shelter every night because, you know, there might not be a bed there. And at least if you make a plan to camp, you know that you will have a tent uh, that night. And there is uh, often more stability in that than there is in um, the shelter lottery. Uh, so I think uh, a couple of the questions that I have, and I fully understand if we haven't made it this far yet in the planning process, um, I assume that the, this new low barrier shelter will be first come, first serve. Um, uh, we haven't, I, I don't think that we've gotten into operations yet. Okay. Can you clarify what you mean by first come, first serve? Essentially, you show up, and if there's a bed available, you'll get a bed. If there's not a bed available, you're turned away. Uh, I mean, I, my preference, again, we haven't established an, sure. any kind of operations plan. My preference would be that people who returned nightly would have a place to stay. I do know um, the stress that it causes when you, have, you show up and have no idea if you have a bed or not. Personally, I cannot imagine that being a humane plan. So um, from, it's not a commitment, but from my perspective, sure. I would work to ensure that we had a management plan that allowed um, for permanent beds to be at the shelter. Great, thank you. Um, and I know that, you know, when we stood up the overnight uh, emergency uh, shelters in the uh, cold weekend that we had over the winter, that there were a lot of concerns around uh, substance use and uh, overdose prevention. So uh, I'm just curious, you know, as these plans progress that uh, we're coming up with some pretty solid plans for addressing that and making sure that staff are well trained and equipped to, to manage that in the most compassionate way possible. Absolutely, yes. Great, uh, I, that is, uh, actually one more question, sorry. You had mentioned that uh, as part of coordinated entry, uh, you're working on more uh, prevention strategies. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. What does that mean in terms of, is that, people losing permanent housing and working to prevent that from happening or? Yeah, sure. One of the things that um, we track is not just the, um, the outflow, so the exits from homelessness, but we also need to track the inflows to homelessness. If we can't understand root cause, and address that, then we're constantly working in a cycle. Um, you know, housing folks to only have them lose housing again or have other people, you know, uh, lose housing. So prevention is a term that we would use, homeless prevention or housing retention, um, we would use pretty interchangeably. And um, we are working right now on establishing um, an intake assessment um, that will eventually be incorporated into coordinated entry um, so that, I mean, Coordinated entry at its core, as I've said, really allows equity and access. So if you, you know, in, in days past, if you showed up to one organization, you got all of the resources that organization had. And if you showed up somewhere else, like, well, you know, I guess you shouldn't have gone there for your case management. And so what coordinated entry does is makes all of the resources available to the whole community so that no matter where you go to access those, you have the same level of access as anyone. So um, right now we do that with homelessness services, and our goal is to do that with prevention services as well. Great. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McGee. We'll go to uh, Councilor Jang to be followed by Councilor Bergman. Um, thank you, President Paul. I got it right. And thank you for your presentation here today. Thank you, too, right, for the great work that you all do. Um, I wanted to ask the first question. It seems that we're talking about only of the adverse weather condition, and we're saying that we have 165, 170 people 
right? So in the first round of exits, uh, there were 170 households or 194 people. Those were the, the folks who were in the adverse weather conditions program. Okay. So how many people do we have the um, extended pandemic era? So the, in the second wave? Phase two, yeah. Phase two, um, that's 184 households or 318 people. And only in Chittenden, do I mean? That's only in Chittenden County. Okay, and how about the maximum day under the GA? How many people? The, the third, the, the third option, the third Oh, what the number phase? that we would see, or the number that we are advocating to stay in the motels, is that what you're asking? So it seems there are three phases, phase one, adverse weather condition, phase two, end of pandemic, right? And phase three, the maximum day under the GA, right? Well, that would be rolling. So they would revert back, the state, from my understanding, would revert back to pre-pandemic general assistance or GA eligibility guideline. And that would allow for um, a 20, a, 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 for the purpose of this conversation, it would allow for a 28-day motel stay. Okay. Yeah, and you know, just I want to say thank you for all of your efforts. You know, thank thank you for doing this, and also thank you so much for bringing new partners into this work because it seems the conversation is leaning toward Burlington only, but you expanded and brought some people in, which is which is great. But at the same time, um, it seems that this could have come sooner. We could have done something a little bit sooner. Than, than right now, uh, because we were all fully aware that this was coming. Instead of a proactive planning, here we are all reacting. And this is not your fault. This is not our fault, right? Um, last Thursday, I hosted Jonathan F um, Farrell, Executive Director of COTS, and also um, Krista James, which is, I believe is the Operation Director of AHS and DCF for both Burlington and the Barry office. And um, a great conversation. We hosted them in a Shittenden Regional Council. As part of your plan here, I did not hear anything about utilizing the, the um, Lady Beach camp area, just like what we did during the pandemic at least for pregnant and children, pregnant women and children. I think it is a fundamental um, aspect of service delivery that we done as a city that at least we need to do for children. And was just wondering why that was not part of the plan. So I think that we, um, there's three, there's sort of three parts of the plan, or two, well, two parts of the plan, 2.5. So there is a plan for individuals, for adults who are leaving, and that is congregate shelter. We acknowledge that um, non-congregate shelter is certainly ideal. In this situation of crisis, we're able to come up with a semi-congregate semi model. Um, I think that to the mayor's point earlier, and also is fully endorsed by the Homeless Alliance, is that any kind of congregate setting for children and families or people who are receiving home health or hospice services is not acceptable. So we have not brainstormed that. We have focused all of our energy on advocating for those vulnerable households to be able to maintain a sense of stability within the motel program while we work to place them in uh, permanent housing. I want to make sure that point is clear, Councilor Jang. So, to we see putting women, children, pregnant women in tents at North Beach would be a far inferior outcome to what we're proposing here, which is for all of the families with children to stay in place at in the hotel program until they are placed in permanent housing. So uh, that's why we're not considering camping at, at North Beach for that population. Um, thank you. And, you know, being in campus and tenting outside are completely two different things. And I'm saying more about the, uh, uh, the campus, renting them and putting it there because we provide some level of security. Um, and also it seemed that there are 30 people that, was going to ex that are going to be exited this week. And I was just wondering if you had a chance to interact with those that are, being, uh, that are affected directly. Have you had that chance yet? 
with the people who have who left motel on Friday or what ex yes I have not been able to connect with folks who left motel on Friday okay. you know, just yeah. based on timing yes yes and I think um, you know in order to solve this problem we need to connect with those people directly with you. and it seems that out of the 30 people two are going to be housed permanently they already found homes too there's also two that are self-paying to stay there by themselves there are four made arrangement already with their families, uh, with their family, family members. There are seven households who, um, who have no plan. There are also four that are going to camp in their, um, in their cars, right? But I urge you to please consider going, reaching out directly to those being affected and just ask them, what are their situation? I think it, we will go a long way. So I just want to clarify the data that you're presenting. It sounds like you had a conversation with Jonathan Farrell at COTS. Um, that, those 30 households are just the households that COTS are working with. There's actually 170 households that were exited from Motel on Friday. Um, the households that COTS is working with, which comprise of those 30, are single individuals. They are not family. There are no children involved in those households. Um, and, you know, I fully agree with you that having communication, direct communication with people with lived experience of homelessness and housing instability is critical to our planning, that we cannot make policy or design plans or concoct, you know, any kind of strategy without having their voices at the forefront of our work which is why for the last month um, I have attended lunches uh, with numerous organizations. We've done outreach to the day station to visit with guests there. We have had lunch at the Community Resource Center. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to Spectrum next week, um, and we're you know, making a very concerted effort to engage people with lived experience to understand what their needs are from their perspective. Great, thank you, Councillor Chang. We'll go to Councillor Bergman. Thank you, and let me echo what everybody said about the thanks that we all have for the work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the work that you put in. This is a lot of stuff that we have to do in a really short period of time, and to expect um, miracles is, you know, I think beyond reason. Um, I am um, interested if you know the number of uh, I'll say campsites or encampments or tents that are in Burlington right now. Um, yeah. So according to um, the uh, most recent meeting with, I'm having a hard time seeing yeah, you. Yeah, they, they've they blocked go. me. <laughs> they've totally blocked me out, but I'm, I'm life is to, like that. Try to, trying to look at you when I talk. Um, yeah. So the most recent meeting that we had with the outreach workers um, indicated that there were actually less established camps and and sort of tents um, within the city and that folks are actually sleeping like truly unsheltered, um, you know, so wherever they lay um, is where they're, where they're residing for the evening. Do we have numbers? We do, yeah, I think. And, and the date for, for that? Uh, you know, like so that, you know, because I know that these things change. Yes, so on uh, Wednesday we were seeing approximately 60 um, to 70 people outside. 60-70. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Outside, okay. Um, and who is counting? We rely on, the unsheltered number is a really challenging number to get, as yeah. I'm sure you can imagine. So uh, we pull together, um, the CEDO actually pulls together all of the outreach workers for Chittenden County. That includes um, the uh, Safe Harbor Clinic um, homeless health care outreach workers. That includes the Howard Center, um, both the street outreach team and their community team that is embedded within police departments and surrounding communities. Um, we engage uh, the uh, BPD, um, CSL staff, um, and the CORA outreach team through CVOEO. So we're pulling together, you know, a large number of people to get that information. This is good. And how often are we counting? Um, we are generally meeting with that team in the past um, and over the winter about every two to three weeks. Um, now we're meeting with them weekly to understand the impacts. And is there anything similar happening outside of Burlington in the county so that we would be able to get a count uh, from South Burlington, you know, of South Burlington, Williston, et cetera? And if you have some numbers, love to hear them. 
So the 60 to 70 is encompassed in the area that we have services. Um, we rely on the Howard community outreach workers that are embedded within the police department in um, Colchester, Essex, Williston, and Shelburne um, to provide information outside of Burlington. So I, I, I just am not totally clear as the the 60 to 70 is, is the total outside in Chittenden County right in now. Chittenden County so we don't know exactly the number in Burlington itself from what the outreach workers are reporting I would say that probably 40 to 50 of those folks okay. are within Burlington that's that's really helpful thank you um, I'm sure but confirm whether you're seeing the need for us to be um, spending more non-human resources, but hu but resources on things like dealing with uh, garbage and what have you. Is that is that true? Um, I think that uh, the outreach teams are providing education around um, life and safety issues um, within camps. They're you know providing hygiene products um, and just you know providing disposal of you know. What, what, what contents um, as necessary. Um, I don't know that we have a specific, you know, budget or idea in mind that hasn't been expressed by the outreach teams as something that um, is an investment that needs to be made at this time. I, I would just note that I've got uh, down the, 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 the old dump road from me where I've lived uh, since there was a dump there, so some 35 years, there's an encampment, has been encampments down there and there are piles of garbage that go uh, last time there were a number of bags uh, we have in the past picked those up so I would think that um, there are increased um, demands on the parks department uh, for that and the reason I sort of ask the size just trying to get that basic information because I'm just wondering whether in addition to state money that we're looking at for big systemic things we're also looking to get some state money to help us with the uh, you know the increased costs that are associated with dealing in Burlington which with something that is our problem but is also a statewide problem and so it, we shouldn't be as the word said ponying up the entire thing on there so I'm wondering if we are asking the state for some of those operational monies to help with the, with the gas and the, the people, et cetera? Uh, the agencies that provide services um, are accessing state funds to support their outreach efforts. Um, to date, the city has not applied for state funding to support um, the kinds of services that you're, um, that you're talking about. So I, I would say that as somebody who sees a parks and rec truck go in front of my house like every day to pick up garbage that's left by folks who are hanging out at the little parklet and that go down the hill and uh, pick them up that perhaps we should be asking the state to help us with that that would be great and the last not a question but a point I was happy to see that the current uh, encampment policy is being relooked at mr. mayor I happy that the um, city attorney is looking at this again, I was struck by the absence of the city council on that list and would ask that you involve the council in the review of that policy. It's something that I know that I and others have a, a keen interest in and uh, I think that uh, that should be corrected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Bergman. We will go to Councilor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Samantha, for this presentation. And I have to say the work that you've done in two weeks' time is absolutely astounding and outstanding. Um, clearly, your problem-solving skills and organizational skills and crisis management is... Uh, is really impressive and we're very, very lucky to have you and the teams that you work with um, picking up all the pieces that were kind of thrown at you. Um, I also am very appreciative of all the legislature legislators who have come to be with us tonight 
to hear about how the pieces are being picked up here. And I want to say I've mentioned this to a few people, um, both inside the legislature and outside, that I don't really understand how we can spend, as a state, $27 million to feed children who are already being fed while not using that money to house people who are not being housed. And I understand that, um, you know, there, there are policy choices and philosophies around these things, but in the hierarchy of needs, this need is great. And I can't say I understand how the legislature works well enough to know if it's still on the table as you go into the veto session to look at some of that money to try and get more money um, to our communities to address this issue. It's not something that can be done on the backs of the property taxpayers. It needs to be on the backs of the income taxpayers. Um, that's not the money that we have access to, of course, unless um, it's provided by the state. And I appreciate the money that has been provided by the state that's allowing us to get as far as you have gotten. Um, the enormous enormity of this weighs on me, and I'm sure it weighs very, very heavily on you. This was so difficult before we had to deal with this. So thank you for giving it everything you have, I'm sure, in the last two weeks to make all of this happen. Um, I'm really grateful to you. And I know I was also consuming some of your time, for which I feel a little bit guilty for, but I appreciate the information in helping me to understand, understand the landscape, landscape better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Shannon. Uh, if there are no others, other councilors that wish to comment on this during this work session, we will, we will finish up by bringing it back to the mayor. Great, thank you, President Paul, and thank you, counselors, for, for this discussion. And um, I'm glad, I'm really grateful that so many of you see um, how much uh, work that has been happening within the CEDO team and, and with partners to, um, uh, to respond to this moment. Uh, I do wanna kind of make a few summary uh, remarks and, and, and speak to a few of the themes that, that came up in the discussion. Um, I, I heard some expression that there could have been more done sooner. I just would ask the, the council to remember how much this city has already done over the last three years. More was done sooner. We created a special assistant on homelessness. We, through great effort, stood up the Elmwood Emergency Shelter. Through great effort, we worked the state to set up the Champlain Inn. We've added six, an additional five, uh, social work positions at the police department that give us a much greater ability to um, engage and, and work with the unsheltered community and connect folks to services and to uh, better options and, and more. Um, what is really happening right now and makes this situation such a frustrating situation is that we are trying to respond to um, state decisions that have been made on a very short time frame and that have been um, shifting even even in the time since we last spoke. When we when we sat down with a, the uh, Department of Children and Families and AHS uh, last last week, uh, I guess actually two weeks ago now, the deadline that that it was July first for this high deeds population, and that has now become July twenty eighth. This is um, uh, it, this is what. I think one of the, I hope one of the overarching points of this presentation is, is that for the worst outcomes that could come out of the state decisions, um, the, they can be avoided through a little bit of time and planning, and that is what we are proposing here with this really um, significant change instead of pushing this high need group, over 300 Chittenden County residents into congregate shelters at the end of July. This, what we have laid out here, and which I really um, am uh, 
uh, would hope the council would see as the city leading on this issue is a plan where that doesn't have to have happen, where we can have a much more humane, much, uh, much better option using the resources that we have created so that, uh, that, that this 300 individuals, 165 households can go dir directly from their hotel, um, <clears throat> from the hotel living that they're currently having into um, permanent housing or at least long-term temporary housing if that proves impossible for some of these households. And that this is really an avoidable humanitarian tragedy uh, that um, can be avoided through this addition of some time and we're proposing paying for it within the resources that were in the budget that, that was vetoed. This is, um, uh, we think, a realistic, affordable, achievable, much better outcome. And then finally, I just want to speak to this make sure it is clear that the, that the we believe we certainly are very much working and have been working for a long time on the long-term solutions to this issue. There's really only one long-term solution to homelessness, and that is building a lot more homes. We have an acute housing shortage. What this has been true for a long time, the this has been created through decades of problematic land use policy at the city and the state level that we have been working to undo here at the city level for 11 years now, and that effort is succeeding. We have nearly 800 homes, uh, very, a substantial portion of them permanently affordable and, per, and committed to housing formerly homeless families that are under construction right now. <clears throat> And we have before you and at the committee level policy changes that will keep this greatly expanded level of housing production uh, continuing in the, in the years ahead. And we hope that the Ordinance Committee will act with urgency um, this month even on the plan that uh, we have put before you to create a South End Innovation District that would have the potential to create about a thousand homes o over the coming years. Um, we hope the council will work with urgency with us following up on the May presentation that we gave to create citywide housing reform that will create the potential for thousands of new homes citywide by re-legalizing older forms of housing that have been made illegal through the actions of our predecessors in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Um, and it is, I do appreciate the opportunity um, to say to our colleagues at the state level, um, we, uh, you know, we support, I certainly support, I think most of us at this table support the S100 and what it does to um, require land use reforms from municipalities. We see it as very consistent with some of the initiatives I was just describing. They're happening here in Burlington. And we very much appreciate that on the House side, uh, after being rejected on the Senate side, that on the House side, there we got a fair hearing on this idea that municipal delegation of Act 250 um, would be the single, remove the single greatest barrier to new housing that exists in Burlington right now for many, many projects, which is this wasteful, redundant, permitting. Municipal delegation is now on a path to happening, and when that happens, it will cut the permitting cost and the permitting time in half for many Burlington projects and projects in other municipalities with robust zoning. I do hope that the legislature just sees that as the very beginning of the really many years of work that is going to need necessary to remove all of the state barriers that exist to the creation of new housing, both in land use and some of the way we regulate environmental contaminants um, and, and more. And um, there's been a lot of talk this year that next year is going to be the year for Act 250 reform. And certainly um, we will, uh, we hope that, that, that you guys will make good on that. I think it's critical if we're going to continue if we're going to avoid future crises like the one we're facing right now, if we are going to make good on the idea that housing should be a human right, we, uh, we need to build a lot more homes. And part of that is, is going to require state action as well as local action. So thank you, President Paul. Appreciate the chance to uh, wrap this up.
Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, there's no formal action that's being taken, so we'll close this agenda item. But before we do, certainly want to join my colleagues in saying that uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the am and tremendous amount of work that has gone on over the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, uh, just want to make sure that you know that even though a lot of this is behind the scenes work um, and clearly not always seen by many, um, that it is incredibly valued and deeply appreciated. Thank you, thank you to all three of you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are actually right on time for the public forum, um, which was gonna start at, seven, at 7.50. Uh, before we begin public, public forum, a few pieces of information. The table that is in front of us um, has three lights, a green light, um, Oh, and, 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 and as well, thank you to all of the legislators that came for the City Place site visit, for this um, conversation on homelessness. Um, we're grateful for your presence here this evening. Uh, so with that, um, with the, as far as the public forum goes, um, so the table in front of us um, has three lights. A green light will shine when you begin speaking. A uh, second yellow light when you have 30 seconds left, and then the last light is a red light, which will shine when your, speak, your time is up. We ask that you please try to complete your comments when the sound and the light indicate that your time is up so that we give everyone the same amount of time and can keep the public forum moving. We have a hybrid system for public forum, so if you wish to speak in person, uh, there are forms that are to my right in the back of the room, um, and I see a couple of people that are using them right now. Um, please bring those to the clerk, which is, who is to my right in front of the room, um, and they will come to me. Um, if you wish to speak via Zoom, if you are joining us online, you can go to Burlington VT forward slash city council forward slash uh, public forum, and a form will come up. Please complete the form and your answers will come into a spreadsheet that I have right in front of me so that I can call on you in the order that you submitted a form. Um, it has been our longstanding practice um, at city council meetings that Burlington residents will have first priority to speak. We will then, we will, the, the, the system is that we will go to Burlington residents joining us in Contois um, who have submitted a form in person, then to Burlington residents that are joining us online then back to non-Burlington residents in person, and then back to our online non-Burlington residents. Uh, during public forum, we have only one request, and that is that you please use respectful language when speaking uh, to speaking to us. We would like to remind everyone here this evening um, and online that there are families who watch our city council meetings as their connection with civic engagement and teaching their children about city government and public discourse. Please, res um, please respect that. Um, direct your comments to me as the chair and not to anyone else at this table. And please do not personalize your comments. We really wanna hear what you have to say and it's a lot easier for us to hear what you're saying and to listen intently if you speak respectfully. Um, with that, um, we will go to the public forum. The, there's a, a number of people that are joining us in person to speak during public forum. The first is Romeo Von Herman, to be followed by Cheryl Boudelier. Good evening. Madam President, Mr. Mayor, good to see you again. Uh, councilors, city administrative team, I'm here to share my concern today as well as um, reaffirm my support for the city's current response to the unhoused uh, situation that is going on, which the mayor currently described as a humanitarian issue, which I do agree with that uh, sentiment. That is to say that um, the council's work is not yet over. Chin and Council uh, Housing Alliance work is not over with respect to this issue. But I understand that uh, they may be here today, some folks who are either unhoused or housed that would like to have their say. This way they can connect with their council members. And hopefully they can get back well, their, their lives back on track 
and get the help that they need. In short, I just want to reaffirm my support in giving these folks the life th that they deserve. I know they're going through a lot, um, and I hope that they get the help that they need. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Our next speaker is Cheryl Boudelier, to be followed by um, Cheryl Green. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I just speak in here. Is it on? It's on. If the Hello? green light is on in front of yeah. you, then it's on. Okay. I just have a few concerns with the police department, for one, and all the homelessness. It was good to hear you all speak your peace of mind, but I think there was a lot of things that could have been done. There's a lot of abandoned buildings that could have been turned into shelters that didn't get any, like the motel on Main Street that was torn down. I feel that could have been used as a homeless shelter. And there's a lot of, I don't know what's gonna to happen to the Catholic Church if they don't know what they're doing with it. I don't know, maybe they do. But why couldn't they use that now as a homeless shelter instead of whatever? And there's a few other places in Burlington. I've been around a long time, and I feel it just, it's, the situation is just out of hand with everything, really. The businesses here are upset with the homeless because they sleep in the doorways and entranceways, and they have to clean it up before they can go to work, they tell me. And I don't know, it's just ridiculous. And there's a lot of garbage on these streets. I don't know what they're not doing to clean it up. I don't know where the money's going for the public works. I see a lot of crap on Cherry Street, garbage everywhere by the terminal. And it's, nothing's being done, it seems, to pick all that up. I've noticed a lot of it. I take a bus a lot, and there's a lot that should be done with that, too. I don't think that they have the right to shut that terminal down in the winter on Sundays or the weekend when it's freezing cold. I don't feel it's right to treat people in the community like they do. And the police, I know they're sure to help, but there's a lot that don't want to be police anymore because it's not a lot of discipline in that department anymore. It's just sad what's happened. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Cheryl Green, to be followed by Dave Marr. Good evening. Yeah, just make sure that the green light in front of you is on. Thank you. Hello. My name is Cheryl Green. I live in Ward 1. Police should always have integrity and always have empathy. Look in the mirror and know that throughout your day, you treated people fairly and respectfully. This is a recent quote from Brattleboro Police Chief Norma Hardy. I am always out talking with people, she said. And my guess is she is very good at de-escalation. To me, that is a key in terms of safety and security, de-escalation. We have that skill in our Burlington Fire Department rescue squad with John Husbands. I have observed it firsthand. Mikey Van Goulden has written in his Chocolate Thunder security website, and one of his team is downstairs tonight. Mikey writes, our licensed guards focus on compassion, de-escalation, and non-judgmental respect for the dignity of others is the key to our success and the safety of our clients." End quote. That is evident in their work in many places around the city. Neil and Andrew are urban park rangers with the Burlington Parks Department. Same open communication and de-escalation skills in evidence. An effective and respected police chief needs to carry that de-escalation capacity themselves, personally and professionally. 
Governor Scott has just signed into law S-36 Act 24. With its passage, law enforcement officers no longer need a warrant to arrest someone for misdemeanor threatening against a healthcare worker or for fighting or engaging in other violent behavior that interferes with medically necessary healthcare services, Vermont Digger. We cannot move forward without it, without that de-escalation capacity in a police chief. I cannot support Thank the you. appointment of John Murad as police chief of Burlington. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Dave. Is Dave Marr? Our, is is Dave Marr to be followed by David Call? Well, thank Good you. Good evening, everybody. That was a that was a good presentation and some great discussion. I was glad to see that included a plan for preventive services, as well as a program to transition people into permanent housing. However, I think there also needs to be greater focus on permanent solutions. Now, I've heard it said that lack of affordable housing is the root cause of homelessness. And that certainly contributes, but I also think that mental health and substance abuse issues are also root causes, and I think those should be addressed uh, at least on an equal basis, not more so than affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, our David, David Call, um, to be followed by uh, De uh, Deborah Clemmer. Hello. And Madam Hi. Chair, Council, and everyone in the room. Um, I'm a community activist, and it's great to be alive. And I'm impressed by work and faith, and our spiritual communities are all working together as a team to make this problem end someday. I'm hoping that the unhoused community have homes. Love and compassion without faith. We have faith in this room. We have faith in the human beings that we're trying to help. And we can help them, if they, and they'll help themselves. It would be such a great room. I just want to thank everybody in this room. It's amazing of how far we have come. It's just a miracle. And I want to just say thank you in so many different ways. I could write it out, but since my stroke, my hand's a little bit weird lately, so, so I'm just going to say, so just have compassion with faith and common sense. I think we're going to make it by 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our, our next speaker is Deborah Clemmer, to be followed by Todd LaCroix. Hello, I'm Deborah Clemmer, and I live in Ward 2 on Clark Street. I came tonight to urge city councilors to vote no for John Murray to be the permanent police chief of the city of Burlington. From his past actions, he is not going to be a leader that unites people. After ballot issue seven in the last election was defeated, I was curious of what was going on in the police commission. I decided and attended two um, commission, police commission meetings in March and April. And what I observed was the acting chief being defensive at times um, when an issue was brought up that he did not agree with. I observed some of the police commission members being very careful and hesitant to address the police chief. He was not open to their feedback. and and in my view, presented himself as not really wanting to hear their comments. I think a person in leadership um, should be open to feedback, even if they don't agree with the problem that is being stated, and that a leader should initiate um, problem-solving strategies with the people that have issues. Um, I saw none of this in the two meetings I attended. I also think he used poor judgment in handling the trauma surgeon at UVM Medical Center. He did apologize, and I appreciate that, but I do, I do not think a leader should be engaged in power struggles and turf wars. And also, the handling of uh, Riverwatch Condominium Association was disturbing to hear. I, un I totally understand why the police want to make more money, um, extra money, 
What I find troubling is the leader went along with it, knowing that the city at the time was desperate for police officers. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Todd LaCroix to be followed by, uh, to be followed by Barbie Alsop. Good evening. With great power comes great responsibility. But there seems to be a disconnect, doesn't there, lately between our leaders. You know, here's the thing about us, you, John, and me, is that we all kind of grew up in the Hollywood era. I am famous for having been the first person to ever put a digital made movie here, but you're famous for being on the X-Files pretending to be a cop. But you see, the difference between you and me is I stopped pretending, and now you're still, I guess, pretending. And we're all very confused as to how you want to be our top cop while you destroy our community, stomp on us with your fake Hollywood pretending. You see, if you want to represent the people, you can't pretend, John. If you could address your you can't have me people pretending around you. You can't use Facebook to manipulate all of us and pretend your way into being good. You have to be good. You have to prove that you're good. You know the previous uh, uh, chief of police that was working for the NYPD before he came here. I was against him, but you know what? I became for him for a moment. You know why? Because on the day that he actually became the chief and I was against him, I said, you know what? Now you have the responsibility to prove to us that the elected leaders were correct in choosing you to be our leader. And for a moment, he actually tried to live up to that. But I've never seen you do that. I've never even seen you try to live up to that promise. You just play politics and manipulate and manipulate and threaten and make up your own rules. Thank you. And everybody so much. knows it. Thank you so much. Just like Our you who pointed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Barbie is Barbie Alsop to be followed by Mark Bouchette. Good evening. To follow. Um, thank you for letting me speak. I live in Ward 3. Um, I want to talk about one thing. Barbie, ju just one moment. I think we have, I think the timer isn't quite reset. Well, it, it's working. No, it should be on the, it should be on ah, green. So green. let's just give it a second. Yay. Now, now, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. I want to talk about de-escalation. Both the mayor and the acting chief assure us that all of our officers are fully trained in de-escalation. Then why would we appoint as a chief of police an acting chief who goes into an emergency room and escalates the situation in front of several of his officers. When he is told that he is not allowed in the room because of HIPAA laws, federal privacy laws, he doesn't de-escalate. He escalates. He threatens with his handcuffs and the hint that he will arrest the treating doctor. Moreover, out in the hallway, his officers are discussing in front of hospital staff charges that they can bring against the treating doctor, stunning the staff around them. Now, a week or two ago, you guys, I'm sorry, let's be more formal, the council approved a settlement from one of the 2018 cases when Officer Bellavance threw a Melly boy into a um, stone wall. Do you think if Officer Bellavance had gone to the Melly brothers and apologized the next day, 
you wouldn't have had to approve that grant? Do you think a chief of police who says out of one side of his mouth that de-escalation is the way to go and then escalates when he gets on the scene is who you want to have as your chief of police? If so, be prepared for more Melly Brothers. Thank you, Barbie. Uh, our next speaker is Mark Bouchette to be followed by Ellen Cooper. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, my name is Mark Bouchette. My family owns Homeport, uh, which has been on Church Street for about 35 years. I'm also chair of the Marketplace Committee. Do you have the, do you have the light? Is the light in front of you green? It is. It is. OK. Just wanted to make sure. I'll, I'll move up. Is that better? Yeah. That's better. Okay. Thank you. I'm here to ask uh, tonight to ask that you vote in favor of the appointing appointment of Acting Chief John Murad. Uh, the position uh, to the position of uh, police of the Burlington Chief of Police of the Burlington Police Department. I've spoken with John on many occasions, and my impression is is that he's dedicated to leading the department into the future with officers committed to the most modern policing tactics, meaning using unarmed CSOs and specially trained CSLs when possible, while also having clear use of force directives that minimize aggression for officers when necessary. I believe that Acting Chief Murad is intent on delivering the kind of modern policing we can be proud of and the kind of policing we expect here in Burlington. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Ellen Cooper to be followed by Don Moskowitz. Good evening. Hi, do I wait for the green light? There. Um, Great. I'm Ellen Cooper. I've been in Burlington since 1974. Um, love the city, have lived in the South End, now live in Word 4. This city has changed. Um, I think that a lot of it has to do with many factors, and I feel that John Murad was put in a situation that was like a bee's nest, and I think he's done a very good job trying to keep things calm, he was great when they were all camping out in the park, which I wasn't allowed to do. Um, but he didn't escalate that. He was calm. He let them stay. And since then, things have gotten completely out of hand with the number of police officers in our city. Um, I feel that we should all be thankful that John Murad hasn't left for all that you've put him through, all the bad mouthing of him. He is a very educated, very compassionate person. I've talked with him many times, and I feel that we need a chief of police that is not interim so that more police officers will be willing to apply for jobs in this city. And as Peter Clavell said, I think there was like 120 officers when he was mayor, and now we have like 30 that are out walking the streets. There's a big problem, but it stems from all of us. We need to treat with respect, and he deserves the respect, and he de deserves a yes vote. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Don Moskowitz, to be followed by Jeff Hayes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Don Moskowitz, and I'm a Ward 5 resident. And I work with communities nationally on homelessness. I appreciate the city's leadership in crisis response, to the state ending the motel program without a transition plan and the leadership of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. I heard several counselors request more data, and it's true, we need more data to actually be able to focus on the right issues and solve the problem. There are HUD systems in place to collect data, and I urge you to advocate for the state to actually collect and provide that data so that we can get a clearer picture of what people's plans are when they are forced to leave the motels. But most importantly, I'd like to lift up the research demonstrating that homelessness is a housing issue. Among communities that have similar rates of mental health, health and substance use challenges, um, we see that it's the communities that face the tightest housing markets in which homelessness is most prevalent. Um, 
those are the communities that have the highest rates of homelessness, and that's clearly what we're experiencing in Burlington and across the state of Vermont. On Thursday, I spent the morning at Motel 6 in Colchester, connecting with people who had to leave. A number of them had vouchers, but could not find a place to rent. A number of them had vouchers that they've been working to secure rentals for months, but could not find a place to rent. Um, please support the long-term solutions we need to aggressively and rapidly build more housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Jeff Hayes, to be followed by Max Tracy. Thank you, counselors. I um, appreciate the time here. Um, I've been a Burlingtonian for 61 years, which I think I just gave my age away. Um, <laughs> and uh, also come from a law enforcement family. And I'm here to take the interim tag away from John Murad and make him the chief of police. Uh, John reminds me a lot of my dad, um, who was a police officer for 28 years, and uh, his calm, his demeanor, his relationships that he builds in the community. Um, he's right for the job, and, and I think it's, it's time to, uh, to make that change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Max Tracy, to be followed by Colin Hilliard. Um, Max, uh, former council president Tracy, nice to see you. Thanks, it's good to be back. Good to see you all, appreciate it. Um, first, wanna just address the uh, houselessness uh, plan. I appreciate the council taking this up in a work session and very much appreciate the seriousness with which the city's addressing it. I'm glad to hear that there is some additional movement around the camping issue um, and the idea of creating a centralized or more centralized camping policy. Um, because we know that if we don't, um, it's just gonna happen wherever it will. So um, I appreciate that. Um, the other, but I do hope that the council is directly involved in these ongoing conversations because I think that um, that's imperative um, just from my experience on the council. The other issue that I'd like to address um, this evening is that of the appointment of Acting Chief Murad. As I think about this appointment, I think about both what, ha what hasn't happened and what has happened. On the, on the, in the column of things that haven't happened, I think we have not seen, nor have we heard, a full-throated and complete acceptance of the fact that systemic racism and white supremacy are huge and continuing factors within our police department. We have not heard that this is a, the chief address this as a systemic issue. Additionally, we have not seen any real progress on oversight or the chief put forward any real vision on, on oversight models uh, in the time that he's been the acting chief. In addition to that, we've also seen a number of things that have happened. We've seen the chief uh, act aggressively towards people, uh, particularly women of color, who have disagreed with him. We've seen the chief um, fail to inform the council of a policy to allow additional, um, to allow additional uh, uh, patrols at Riverwatch. And we've also seen uh, the, the chief threaten to arrest the, um, the, uh, a doctor who was providing care to a gunshot wound victim. I don't regret many vo votes on the city council, but I do regret my vote on, on Brandon Del Pozo because there were so many warning signs and we chose to avoid that, we chose to ignore them. In this case, there are plenty of warning signs, but if you choose to ignore them, that will be on you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Colin Hilliard to be followed by Sandy Baird. Thank you. Uh, Colin Hilliard, I'm a Ward 3 resident. I'm also the Deputy Director of the Burlington Business Association, I'm speaking in support of the appointment of John Murad. Uh, Burlington has been without a council-confirmed chief since 2019. In that time, our cities faced serious challenges with police staffing and public safety, affecting residents, businesses, and visitors alike. Uh, the appointment of the permanent chief is a critical step for our city's future, the chief plays a key role in officer recruitment and retention, uh, the ability to deliver much needed public safety services in Burlington, and in creating just, effective, and transparent 21st century police department. Uh, the city's ability to provide public safety services is, of, is an issue of concern to everyone, including our downtown businesses and their staff. Appointing a permanent chief of police, one who can serve with the support of the community, um, is critical. It's critical to rebuilding our police department, it's critical to the future direction of that department, and it's critical to the future of downtown and the city that we all love. 
Uh, the BBA and its 300 plus members offer its strong support for the appointment of a permanent chief of police. Please vote yes to confirm John Murad as chief of police. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Sandy Bear to be followed by Pat Rivers. Hi, good evening. My name is Sandy Baird and I live in Ward 1. Um, uh, and I firmly support the uh, appointment of John Murad as chief of police. But let me say something else because I am very disturbed about an incident that occurred at the police department the other night. Um, as many of you know, um, I am an attorney and I'm, I have been both a prosecuting attorney and also a defense attorney. The other night, a black woman, a client of mine, was in custody in the police department. Uh, it was 11.30 on a Friday night and so I attempted to call her. She, was, she also is an African, new American woman from the Sudan. Her English is not good. She has significant problems. Um, I tried to call her to warn her that anything she said could be used against her and that she had the absolute right as a resident of the United States to remain silent. I could get no one on the phone, no one. Nobody answered the phone at the police department. Secondly, I got so upset about this that I went to the police department at 11.30 at night with um, a colleague of mine, Tato Ratsibe, who is the co-director of the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. We sat in the parking lot, unable to get into the police station. This is right near Battery Park, as some of you know, which has been the scene of crimes. For the first time in my life, I was nervous about being alone, an old woman, essentially, in the parking lot of the police sta in the parking lot of the police station. No one was there. No one could be called. No one could be reached. This is very concerning to me. Finally, a police officer did come out, and I asked, "Can I talk to my client? It's her absolute right to talk to her attorney." And he said, "Quote: Lawyers are not permitted in the police station." Now this is a serious violation, I believe, of her constitutional rights to talk to a police to talk to a lawyer. I appoint John Murad because I trust him to do the right thing and to make serious corrections within the police department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Pat Rivers, to be followed by Terry Rivers. Good evening. Thank you for this chance to speak, and uh, I will be very brief. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for your service, every one of you. Um, I don't come here often, but I follow what you do. I may not agree with some of you, but I respect you, and I appreciate you, particularly during these last three years when all the crises have seemed to rain down on this beautiful city that I love so very much. Uh, I'm here tonight in support of the appointment of John Murad as permanent chief. I do hope that you will vote uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Terry Rivers uh, to be followed by Dave Hartnett. Hi, good evening. My name is Terry Rivers. I'm a, a resident of Ward 5, and I am also here in support of the appointment of John Murad. Um, I've heard a lot of people criticize him and certainly um, those of us who've ever made mistakes in our lives, and I guess I would look at everybody, um, I think the, the quality for me that I'm looking at with John Murad is that he takes responsibility for what he did. I know a lot of people who've made terrible mistakes in politics, in their lives as professionals, and they deny responsibility, they avoid responsibility, they lie about what's happened, but he didn't do that. He's taken responsibility for the mistakes he's made in uh, his work here in Burlington, and I don't in any way doubt his commitment to this department and his commitment to hiring well-trained professional police officers who also make mistakes, who need to be held accountable like we all do. So um, I'd like to see him be given a chance and bring some stability to the city of Burlington's police department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dave Hartnett to be followed by Karen Long, uh, former Councilor Hartnett. Thank you. <clears throat> I was downtown this weekend and I noticed the state troopers' vehicles parked at Church in Maine. And I thought to myself, those should be Burlington police officers, not state troopers. I appreciate what they're doing, but it's really getting old, right? Those are Burlington police officers that should be there building relationships with our merchants, with our residents, with our vendors, 
with our homeless people. That's how you build relationships. That's not going to happen until we have a permanent chief. We talk about oversight. I think everybody in this room wants oversight. Certainly not what we had on the ballot in March, but true oversight. That doesn't happen without a permanent chief. You need buy-in from all sides. And if you think an acting chief is going to lead the way on oversight with his men, it's just not going to happen. They want to know. People want to know. Officers aren't going to come here if they don't know if we have a chief. They're not coming to an acting chief. I don't care how much you pay them. You can't buy your way out of this. No question about that. Listen, John's made mistakes. He's not perfect. Nobody said that. He really doesn't even deserve this job. He's earned it. For three years, he's been on a job interview. Can you imagine the pressure that must be? All your critics just waiting to pounce on every mistake you make. Can you imagine working under those conditions? Any of us? I just don't see that. The only way we're going to turn this department around is to have true leadership. And until we have that, we're going to be in the same situation over and over again. I want to get back to true community policing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker and last uh, Burlington speaker that I have is Karen Long. Karen, good evening. Hi there. Jesus. I always feel like they're going to slip out. So um, I didn't come to talk about the police. I came to ask about this, what I read, that the administration is, I don't know, encouraging the council to support an $18 million loan to City Place developers. And I am concerned that it was buried in the agenda. It was a consent agenda. I think it was number 29. And this is something, like I've followed City Place for years and years. So this is a really big deal to me. Um, this sounds a lot like Burlington Telecom, the 17 million that we loaned um, to build that up. And you know, which this administration in particular totally was against that. So. Anyway, I'm wondering why we would lend millions when year after year this project has failed to, to secure financing on the open market. And we've had many years of meetings uh, with the developers about this. Um, I'm wondering why we, the city, would circumvent the rules and deadlines associated with TIF dollars when those rules and deadlines were made to protect the public interest. Uh, the audit report shows we are at odds with the state because of our handling or mishandling of TIF funds. How meaningful and sincere are development agreements when we amend them so readily whenever a developer fails to comply? We would not, and again, I went to every meeting about this, but we would not be here. We had a pre-development agreement that said the city place construction would not start until they had financing. But we, we let them out of that. We let them tear down our what we had. Anyway, basically, please um, make the, have the developers do what they are supposed to do and not give away to financing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will go now to Burlington residents that are joining us online, um, unless there are others, are, do we have any other, do we have any other pages? Okay. Um, the first, we'll, we'll reset that and just have a timer that'll be up on the screen. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Robert Kiernan and uh, Robert, I found you and enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Uh, thank you. I would like to acknowledge the many residents downtown here in Ward 3 and elsewhere 
in our city who support acting Chief Muir's appointment as chief of the Burlington Police Department. And at the same time, recognize those residents and friends who have not been supportive of this from their point of view. Both positions have been held for some time in our city. It's really time now to coalesce on this issue and come together in support of the appointment of John Muret, who has been and is demonstrating his leadership ability in addressing the public safety challenges that are quite apparent in Burlington. There have already been noticeably demonstrated successes here, and we, we will see continued positive impact in our city's future with John Muret as our chief of police. Living downtown in Ward 3, we are currently experiencing a positive daily re-energized environment that is now emerging on our streets here and in the Church Street Marketplace. This is the time to build on this welcome indication of improvement and to me, an important time for more collaboration with a movement away from the entrenched positions of rhetoric and ideological resistance which have been held for quite some time regarding the police chief position and that were put forth once again in public statements made as recently as today. Repeating, it's now time to continue forward side by side and confirm Chief Muir. Thanks. Our next speaker is Amy Malinowski. And Amy, I have found you and enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Great, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Great. Uh, my name is Amy Malnowski, and I'm asking that City Council vote no to confirming Acting Chief Murad. Uh, here are five reasons why. Uh, one, Acting Chief Murad has stated publicly that he does not believe racial bias is an issue for policing in Burlington, um, and this runs contrary to the data. BIPOC neighbors are more likely to be stopped by police and more likely to have force used against them during interactions with the police. I don't know how myself or my neighbors, especially those who are the most pleased, can trust him when he can't acknowledge this data or facts. Um, I feel like this is really a non-starter and uh, I don't know if I have to read the rest of this list, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, number two, there's a repeated pattern where community stakeholders find uh, Murad to not be collaborative and meant to be disrespectful and so much so that the police commission has referred um, some of his recent actions to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council for uh, investigating misconduct. <laughs> Additionally, multiple police commissioners have spoken out on their experiences, Murad. Commissioners Stephanie Seguino, Milo Grant, and Susan Comerford all said they've witnessed Murad become defensive and unprofessional in commission meetings and during executive sessions, particularly toward female commissioners. Um, and actually, I believe I witnessed a peek into this combativeness myself during the most recent joint committee meeting last week. Uh, number three, Acting Chief Murad is a proponent of the broken windows theory of public safety, which has been thoroughly debunked. Four, there's a pattern of fear-mongering and misinformation that's been pretty pervasive over the past couple of years. We're constantly told we can't have both, quote, like a rebuilding of the police and appropriate public uh, police oversight. Um, and so, and furthermore, that all this is really emergency because crime is spiking. Um, and in September of 2021, the ACLU even called out Murad for contributing to these false narratives with his press releases um, and public speaking. And then the fifth thing, lastly, I just want to reiterate specific incidents of betrayed trust. Uh, Riverwatch, not staffing downtown during the weekend overnight hours of summer 2021, and the threats to the surgeon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, and please correct me if I mispronounce your name, uh, Amy uh, Wagling. Uh, Amy, I found you and enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Hi, thank you. My name is Anna Wagling. So you were <laughs> close. <laughs> not really. <laughs> there, thank you so much <laughs> all right thank you um my name is anna waggling i'm one of the community support liaisons at the burlington police department and i'm also a ward two resident i wanted to make public comment after reading a front porch forum post by a council member regarding our team the note stated cape is staffed with non-sworn officers that's a misnomer we are social workers we're not non-sworn officers. That's a reference to community service officers who enforce certain ordinances in the city. CAPE also includes our domestic violence victim advocate, victim support specialist, and one sworn officer assigned as a domestic violence prevention officer. Last week at the PD, I helped pack up the apartment of someone I'm working with who has zero support, helped another person fill out a no stocking order, a relief from abuse order, 
and attended a family update at the hospital of a young refugee client who is critically ill. On Saturday specifically, I helped a mother and young daughter get to the Midwest after being dropped off at the airport by Border Patrol. They only spoke Spanish and had no resources to navigate where they needed to go. Someone called the police for help. I responded within minutes. I got them safe and warm in our soft interview room, helped purchase bus tickets and drove them to the bus stop 20 minutes away. We work parallel to law enforcement in the aftermath of crises to connect community members to services and we show up. We meet people where they're at. We collaborate with officers in person to provide these services. As there continues to be conversation around where we should be housed and the structure of our program, I welcome, I urge council members to meet with us in our space, see how we serve the community and hear our stories. Talk to us, we work seven days a week. Thank you. Jana. Our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Farrell and um, there is someone here. I do have someone named John. I uh, don't know if that is you. Maybe you can just use the raise hand function if that is you and I will be happy to call on you. Um, we also are, the next speaker is John Tracy. Again, there is someone named John. Um, I can enable that microphone and then if you could just simply identify yourself for the record. You, you, please go ahead. Karen, it's Council President, it's John Tracy, you want me to go? Yes, that would be great. Thank you so much, John. No problem, thank you. And thank you all for your service. Public service is hard and we do appreciate that as citizens of Burlington. Uh, leadership is challenging and difficult. Leadership in the public eye is challenging and difficult. And leadership in the public eye in law enforcement in this time of change is extremely difficult. And I think John Murad has done an exceptional job. In my professional career, I had a number of instances where John was engaged with some interactions. They were not escalated. In fact, the demeanor that he brought, the engagements, the way he engaged in the dialogue, the respectful manner in which he had conversations with people made it to where, you know, the results that could have been difficult were not. Another instance on Church Street, when I was trying to help someone who was being rather disruptive find resolution, even though John was off duty, he came over and said, is everything okay? And I said, yeah, it is. And over the course of the day, we were able to help him along. And so he's never really off duty. You know, leadership, we identify our strengths and our weaknesses. The challenge is to make sure that people help us with those strengths. And once those weaknesses are identified, which have been identified, we can make leadership teams better. It's a lifelong process. While other people, law enforcement officers have left Burlington, uh, John Murad has stayed. He knows the lay of the land. I think his willingness to engage, to listen and to learn and the experience he brings are really important for Burlington. And as a resident of Burlington, I will do whatever I can as a citizen to make him successful as chief, our police department responsive to our citizens and the city of Burlington, the better place where they all want it to be. So I strongly support John Murad as chief of police. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Our next speaker is Jerry Prenke. And uh, Jerry, I've not been able to locate you. Um, certainly, if you want to use the raise hand function, I'll try to find you as I move on to the next speaker, which is Jake Schumann. Um, and Jake, uh, I did find you. Uh, you should, I just enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that this conversation that we're having tonight about the relative merits and demerits, the character and conduct of acting chief Murad and whether he's fit to be our permanent chief is the wrong conversation to be having. I think that we need to reflect on why we are here. And it is not because of anything that he has done. It is not because of anything he hasn't done. It is because of the choices of our mayor. Mayor Weinberger has chosen to bring this appointment he has chosen to lie to the people of this city saying that he had seven votes to confirm when he was still whipping those votes. Um, 
I think that we as a city have very much agreed that we want to move forward with our policing to make it safer and more collaborative. And we have been working on these efforts. We have a joint committee for police oversight. Uh, in December, on December 20th, 2021, the council voted to allocate $75,000 to continue the search for a qualified chief. Um, and Moreau chose not to accept that money to not reopen the search. He has chosen to take no action to provide options to the people or to the council. He has forced your hand. And I think that the only option is to table this vote for the next mayor uh, to bring a, an appointment for consideration. I think that there are reasons to support Murad. There are more reasons not to, but we as a community don't want to be divided. We want to be united and we should unite under a new mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Kelly Halstead. And Kelly, I have found you and enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Hello, my name is Kelly Halstead. I live in Ward 4. Um, I'd like to speak in support for John Murad as our acting chief, um, which I'm sad that we're at this point that he has been acting for so long. Um, not only does John come um, as a Vermonter, that he was raised in Vermont, he's one of our own. Um, he's also very well qualified. Um, and I know that people have talked about trying to find uh, another search. I think that we have found someone that is more than capable, who has shown, um, despite his qualifications, that his commitment to public service, that he's risen above challenges that, is, that have been put in his, uh, in his path, frankly, in my opinion, by the council itself, um, by defunding the police and and that as a result has um, made his job all the more difficult and he has tried to meet um, what the people are asking of him in increasing transparency um, and for example um, you can go on the website and see things and video camera footage um, I think that has been wonderful he's also been meeting people out um, when they have, you know, the homeless, uh, when there was a camping out in Battery Park. Um, and he continues to um, do his job with honor and distinction. And I hope that we will finally be able to move his nomination forward so that he is uh, now our chief of police. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Claire Wool, and Claire, uh, I do not see you online. Um, again, if you if you are under another name um, and can just identify yourself, that would be great. Um, the next speaker is Jeff Halstead, and as well, I do not see you online either. Um, Please use the raise hand function. Um, well, I see someone using the raise hand function. Um, uh, Kelly, is 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 Jeff with you? Yes. Okay. Uh, please go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to again second what my wife had said. I have. Uh, um, I think John's deserved this chance. Uh, he's done a lot for the community, uh, and appreciate everything he's done. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker joining us online is Peter Hartledge, and I do not see you online either. Um, again, I'll keep this up if you want to use the raise hand function, and that would also apply uh, to Jonathan Farrell, who I wasn't able to locate either and am still unable to locate. Um, with that, uh, we'll keep that. Up. We will. We'll keep, we'll take the timer down for those joining us online and go back to those that are in Contois. There is one person, a non-Burlington resident, who wished to address the council, and that's Becky Cassidy.
Good evening. I'm Becky Cassidy, Vice President of the Queen City Police Foundation Board. I also served for 17 years as the Marketing Director of the Church Street Marketplace. I grew up in Burlington and I'm a proud graduate of Burlington High School. The Queen City Police Foundation provides funding for innovative Burlington Police Department projects that better serve the community, improve engagement and communications, and foster excellence in policing. In addition, the foundation provides assistance to officers, employees, and or families facing challenges. I have known and worked with and appreciated Chief John Murad since he was hired as Deputy Chief in 2020. I have observed and benefited from his calm, enlightened, educated, well-organized approach to policing and his expert management of the department. As I am in the police department often on foundation business, I have frequently seen the, pre the chief interacting both with his officers and the public. John is a listener, a keen observer, and a significant deliverer of the best in policing. I watched the encampment in Battery Park and listen to the chief interact, carefully consider, and sometimes comfort protesters there. His regard and respect for people of every color and origin was impeccably demonstrated. This is a man who works weekends and holidays, patrol and holiday patrol shifts so that his officers can recharge and have time with their families. This is a man whose integrity, decency, energy, and morality guide the Burlington Police Department. He has been doing the job every day and providing very significant service to Burlington in an unexpectedly challenging time. This isn't the Burlington I grew up with, but it is a, a Burlington immeasurably safer and better protected because of the leadership and courage of John Murad. The foundation board unanimously supports the approval of John Murad as permanent chief of the Burlington Police Department. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that, uh, I wasn't able to locate the other people who um, had wanted to speak online, and we've gone through the list of those people who wanted to speak in Conchois. So with that, at um, 8.47, we will close the public forum with our appreciation for all of you who spoke during public forum. The next item on our agenda is item number five, which is climate emergency reports. Um, is there any counselor or the administration who wishes to offer a climate emergency report? Uh, Councilor Bergman. Um, I don't know how many of us um, are focused on the, uh, the climate implications of air travel. And um, I know that it's been exceedingly troublesome for me um, as I'm into retirement and have lots of pressures to go visit lots of places that I cannot drive to. Um, and so it has created um, some enough tension where I've been starting to pay attention about this conundrum that we as a human species are facing um, at a time um, of climate change, which is only getting worse. And I just want to say that there is an international movement around lowering uh, airline emissions and emissions from airplanes, um, which is significant and growing. And we should be paying attention to that. And I just want to note that um, last week there was an international set of demonstrations uh, meaning all around the world, and that included um, an, an, a community action. I did not participate, but it was something that happened in, in Burlington where um, about 30 people showed up and um, it was part of a, um, like I said, this international um, effort. And there are live questions that we are fielding it in the TUC uh, regarding um, cutting airline emissions, not only from the big uh, emitters, the big planes, but also from smaller planes, which uh, I, I read um, are um, fairly inefficient. So um, I, I raise this because whether individually we like it or not, whether we're challenged by it or not, it is out there. 
and we ignore the implications of all of the aspects of our modern industrial life and uh, at our peril, at our children's peril, at our parents' ch peril, and dare I say for the umpteenth time for our grandchildren and their children's. So I'll continue to, to harp on that because of how important uh, they all those generations are to me and I hope that we pay attention to this particular aspect of climate change. And I'll let uh, Councillor Barlow talk later about the, uh, the, the, the biomass uh, symposium that we're having next week on, uh, on McNeil, which we're all looking forward to. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Bergman. Uh, were there any other councillors who wish to offer a climate emergency report or the administration? Uh, seeing none, we'll close out that item. And before we go to our consent and deliberative agendas, we do have a local control commission meeting that we need to attend to. So with that, um, I'll recess the council meeting at eight, uh, 851 and we'll call to order the local control commission at the same hour um, and give everyone a chance to get to that agenda. As we, as we all navigate um, our new software, we have left board docs behind and uh, welcome to the new age of civic clerk and we're all getting used to it. This is our first meeting using the new software. So with that, um, the first item on our agenda is 1.1, 1 .1, um, which is a motion to adopt the agenda. And for a motion, I'll go to the chair of our license committee, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Thank you, Commission Chair Paul. I move to, um, and I'm really proud to have found this so quickly. Um, <laughs> I move to amend, adopt the agenda as follows. Add to the consent agenda item 2.1, first class liquor license renewals 2023-2024, Blue Cat Cafe and Wine Bar. Add to the consent agenda item 2.2, third class liquor license renewals 2023-2024, Blue Cafe, Blue Cake Cafe and Wine Bar. Add to the consent agenda item 2.3, outside consumption permit renewals 2023-2024, Blue Cat Cafe and Wine Bar, and Pizzeria Verita. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Is there a second to that motion? Um, seconded by Councillor Travers. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt our agenda as amended? Uh, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, we have our agenda. Uh, we have a uh, uh, consent agenda, um, and for that I'll go again to Commissioner Shannon. Move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Uh, seconded by Councillor Travers. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. We have uh, six items on our deliberative agenda. The first is 3.1, which is a first and third class liquor license application for farmers and foragers. Uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 first and third class liquor license applications for farmers and foragers, 75 Penny Lane with all standard conditions. Thank you uh, for that motion, seconded by Councillor Travers. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the 2023-2024 first and third class liquor license application uh, for this business, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously, which brings us to 3.2, an outside consumption permit application for farmers and foragers dockside, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 outside consumption permit application for farmers and foragers, 75 Penny Lane. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Uh, seconded by uh, Commissioner Travers. Um, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. 
That motion passes uh, unanimously, which moves us to item 3.3, .3, an outside consumption permit application for Pizzeria Ida. Move to approve the 2023-2024 outside consumption permit application for Pizzeria Ida. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Seconded by Councilor Tra uh, Commissioner Travers. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Which brings us to uh, item 3.4 a first-class liquor license application for Poppy's Market and Cafe. Uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 first-class liquor license application for Poppy's Market and Cafe, 88 Oak Street, with all standard conditions. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Seconded by Commissioner Travers. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, all those, in, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. We have two more to go. The fifth item is 3.5, a first and third class liquor license application for wings. Uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 first and third class liquor license application for wings, 205 St. Paul Street, with all standard conditions. Thank you so much for that motion. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Travers. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve this first and third class liquor license application, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously, which brings us to the last item on our deliberative agenda, which is 3.6, an outside consumption permit application for wings. Commissioner move, Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 outside consumption permit application for wings at 205 St. Paul Street. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Seconded by Commissioner Travers. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. Um, Thank you so much to the members of the uh, License Committee for your work and as well to the Clerk of the Council, Lori Olberg. Uh, with no other business on this agenda and seeing no objection, we will adjourn the Local Control Commission meeting at 8.58 and return to our uh, Council meeting. And we will continue where we left off with item number six, which is our consent agenda. Is there a motion to move the consent agenda and take the actions as indicated? So moved. Uh, thank you so much, Councillor McGee. Seconded by Councillor Jang. Um, is there any discussion on that motion? Uh, Councillor Hightower. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, if the administration is willing, give them the chance to address one of the comments in public forum, um, specifically relating to the First Amendment to the a, the restated development agreement between the City Place and City Place developers. Um, and I think specifically the question was why we're loaning $18 million to developers to start the project. Um, so I don't know if the administration feels... We'd be happy to address that, and he will. That item is actually removed from the um, oh, great. consent okay, agenda, so we'll, we'll get to that in just a couple of great. minutes. Um, no worries, no problem. Um, if there are no other questions on the uh, or comments on the deliberative on the consent agenda, we'll go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the cons uh, consent agenda and taking the actions as indicated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Um, and that moves us to our deliberative agenda. Uh, we have 11 items on our deliberative agenda. And for those um, items that are not permits or public hearings, there are uh, time limits on the other remaining agenda items. We will do our best to keep to those time limits. Um, the first item on our deliberative agenda is item 7.1, which is the 
item that you were just referring to, Councillor Hightower, which is the first amendment to the second amended and restated development agreement. This had been consent item 6.29 and was removed at the request of Councillors Bergman and Grant. Um, before we get to comments from the council, I will go to Councillor Travers for a motion. Thank you, President Paul. I move to approve and authorize the mayor to execute a first amendment to second amended and restated development agreement with City Place Partners, LLC, in substantial conformance with the draft uh, posted with our agenda online and subject to the final review and approval of the city attorney's office. And upon a second, we yield the floor to the mayor. Great, thank you so much. Uh, seconded by, um, se seconded by Councilor Shannon. Um, we can go to the mayor, or would you would you prefer do that? And then, if there are if there are counselors who have questions, we can certainly go. Um, yes, would you like? Okay. Uh, yes, for example, I'd like to say a, a few words to um, <clears throat> uh, set the context here and uh, make sure the public is is clear that we had the chance to talk about this item in executive session last week, but this is the first uh, public discussion of this matter. So um, I, I'm. Appreciate the chance to um, speak to why why we are doing this. We also have uh, here with us the uh, attorney that we have been working with has sort of been leading the city's work on this transaction, Tim Sampson. And um, uh, if counselors do have questions, it's uh, likely that we'll uh, have Tim responding as he's very familiar with this document, has really been the chief author of the original document and, well, the the Art at 2.0, at least. He was, uh, there was an Art at 1.0 many years ago before Tim's involvement, but Tim has been involved for several years now. When the council approved the Arta 2.0, um, which again stands for the Amended and Restated Development Agreement, uh, in November, I believe, of 2022, we did so for one, uh, very compelling reason, um, at least it was compelling to me, and I, th I think a unanimous uh, decision by the council that um, we should find a way um, for the developers to move forward and end the long hiatus at the project that had seen the project stalled for over four years, approximately four years, and give them a, an ability to move forward and start with site work and what uh, and foundation work and really what we call the podium, the concrete um, base of this one block wide project. And we did that with full discussion that uh, the developers were quite transparent and clear that they were still working on the permanent financing, but they were willing to take really all the, the risk involved in ensuring that once started, the podium would be completed. and from, and, and they are in the process of doing that, as you saw on your site walk earlier tonight, there's a great deal of activity that has taken place since the approval of ARTA 2.0 and what is only possible because of that approval. Uh, something that we discussed a lot at the time, Tim made the point frequently, is that the, there were likely to be future amendments to the uh, ARTA. Uh, over the years that we would be working under it and working towards the completion of this multi-year, uh, many tens of millions of dollar project. And, what, and this is the first time that we are back um, to address some of those refinements and changes that have taken place since, uh, since last year. The, um, the most significant change um, is that we uh, are changing the way in which the uh, city is uh, protected and, in sh and guaranteed to um, not be taking risks going forward from this point because of some uh, changes in circumstances. And I think actually at this point I'd let Tim maybe kind of outline what those uh, what those changes are. The, the principle um, that has guided this project since the start is that the city should not be taking construction risks, the city should not be taking development risks. Really, the city is prepared to put public money into the creation of 
public infrastructure, which is what this transaction would do. This is not, it was suggested during the public forum that this is a loan to the private developers, um, and it is not. This is the, the city borrowing, um, and the city intends to do that borrowing later this month, uh, and holding on to those funds uh, as we wait for the public infrastructure to reach future milestones. And so this structure, uh, preserves and in some ways makes stronger the city's protections um, and ensuring that we m make good on that principle, that we not take financial risk here. We'll put public money into the effort, but we're not going to take the risk. And to kind of get into a little bit of the specifics of that, I hand it over to Tim. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Um, again, as the mayor said, this isn't a loan. Um, this is very, a fundamental part of the project since the beginning. It's the, it's the city's ability, the city's mechanism to fund the public portions of the project. So it's not a loan to the developer, it's the mechanism to reimburse the developer for building what typically a municipality would build. Um, the, and importantly, as the mayor said, the developer doesn't have access to these funds that we're talking about until they build the public infrastructure. Um, I think it's also important to say, since we were here before too, um, the City Place partners have done what they told you they were going to do um, in November of 22. As the mayor said, they started construction right away. They've been at it ever since. And they've importantly entered into what we call the TIF construction contracts for over $50 million of work. Um, in response, the city has also performed under the development agreement. Um, the city brought to you and the council approved in February the application for the VEPSI approvals for the TIF uh, financing. Um, those approvals came um, from VEPSI in March, uh, and the city has, has come back to the council in May to pr approve the, the, uh, the, the financing uh, going forward, the TIF financing. So what are we really doing here? It's not, as the mayor said, there's not a fundamental change. It's really a, a, an adjustment to the mechanisms uh, that were allowing the development agreement to come to fruition. Um, so what am I talking about? There is a June 30 deadline, as you recall, a legislative deadline, for the issuance of the TIF debt. But at this point in the construction process, in the development process, I should say, really, the City Place Partners hasn't put together all of the financing for all of the project. And so if you were going to issue permanent debt, you would, you would be able to issue it on construction contracts that amount to a quarter to a third of what the project will ultimately be. And that means that there's less construction to support the ultimate tax increment that is going to pay back that debt. So we don't want the city to issue permanent debt before June 30th. So what do we do? We can't avoid the June 30th deadline. The, the city has an opportunity to imp implement um, the, the process by issuing interim debt. And what that is is a short-term 12-month, I guess 11 and a half month uh, note at a fixed rate the proceeds of that are going to be controlled by the city, not released to the developer until they develop the public improvements. Um, and that uh, the risk of that borrowing, right, the cost of borrowing that money for that period of time is going to be secured by the, develop by the developers posting a cash escrow uh, to cover the, the debt service, the, the incremental debt service on, on, on that borrowing if there is any. Um, so, again, in, as I see it, it's really, um, there's no change in the fundamental approach. There's no new $18 million. It's certainly not a loan. It never was, and it isn't now. Um, it is a, a, a tool that, had we known exactly we would need this in November, we would have written it into the deal then. Um, we didn't know it then, but that is the nature of these things. Um, circumstances play out, and we adjust as we go forward. Um, and, and I think really, you know, that, that, that's the part of the, uh, the financing piece of this. Um, there are uh, uh, several other, I think, more minor um, components of the amendment. So since we've got an amendment before you, we'd like to be as comprehensive as we can. Um, I think you're aware generally that the, uh, the developers are back in front of the DRB for some um, changes to the project that are fairly modest, but that do, that do um, kind of directly uh, uh, come, not, I'm not going to say in conflict, but they bump up against some of the way we described the project previously in the development agreement. 
Um, the, the items are, there was formerly intended to be a restaurant, you may recall, on the top floor of the building with an observation deck that was going to be open to the public. Final design of the project has, has removed the um, restaurant up there. It has found more space in the building for additional residential units. Um, but there will not be a rooftop observation deck. In return, the developers are providing additional public space by, in, in the form of public restrooms at the ground level um, that would be, um, in many respects, probably more, um, more usable to the public. Uh, they're also, as I mentioned before, have found the ability to uh, reduce some mechanical space in the building and provide additional units. They'll have up to you know, a unit range of 400 to 495 units. We had references in the ARTA 2.0 to 425 or so units, so we want to make these, these documents consistent. Um, we think that's a good thing. The more units they can provide is, is a better thing in these times in particular. And then finally, they, in the, in the context of their uh, ongoing development um, of the program for the project, want the option, um, not a not, not, not a certainty, but an option to provide for a small hotel in a portion of the project as well, up to a 140-room hotel. Um, again, it would, it would displace some of those residential units, but still have a, have a minimum of 400 units in the project. So those things are being processed through the DRB process. Um, the reason we're talking about them now is because, again, those changes would, would, um, would kind of bump up against the, some of the way we described the project previously. So, that's the summary of, of what's before you. Again, I I uh, I, I, I would not <laughs> I would not be surprised if bef in over the next couple of years we're not back again talking about ch circumstances that have changed again, and reasons that we may need to adapt with those circumstances. Fundamentally, the principles at place here are not changing. Fundamentally, the protections that we have in the development agreement for the city are not changing, and that will continue. Um, throughout the project. Thank you so much. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add, Mayor Weinberger, before I go to the council? No, I think, um, I think that's uh, hopefully plenty to kick this off and happy to answer any further questions. Great, thank you. So, Councillor Bergman and Councillor Grant, you had both um, asked to have this item removed. Before I go to Councillor Hightower, I'm happy to go to one of you. I, I just want to thank our rules, our president, for removing it. It's absolutely essential that we got this. Um, from my standpoint, it makes a lot of sense, and I'll be supporting it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Grant, did you want to add anything before I go to count? Um, just that it was, I felt important to talk about publicly. I think this is a very important project. I think that people don't want to feel like any information is being hidden from them. Um, thank you. Rightly so, and certainly I was, I am the person who does the agenda, and I am glad that you both asked to have it removed. Um, Councillor Hightower, did you want to add? Nothing. Just agree with my two colleagues. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, are there any other councillors who wanted to speak to this? Uh, Councillor Jang. Um, thank you. I also want to thank the developers for inviting the council and the other legislators at the visit today, the site, it was beautiful. Um, and since these questions are coming up, I was just also wondering if they can uh, publicly make a statement about where, they, where things are at. I think it would be very beneficial because today what we heard from them is their work with approximative um, neighbors of the site. They're doing great work in terms of communication and engagement. And these type of efforts also, I think the, the, the bigger community need to know about it. And we're urging the, maybe the developers to consider uh, putting a statement about the development of their efforts. I think it would be beneficial. Great, Councillor Jang. So we do have uh, two of the partners, uh, City Plate local partners here with us, and they're making their way downstairs, and I'm sure we'd be happy to address that. Sorry, I was upstairs. I didn't hear your uh, question. Yeah. Um, First, thank you so much for the 
visit, side visit today. It was great. And also it was great to hear from you directly about the engagement of the people, the building approximative to the site. I think it's great. So a, a community member just have some concern about this and I'm glad that Tim was here to clarify it and was just wondering about you to maybe speak about how do you plan to keep the community at large, not only those that are close to the site, about what is going on, what are your efforts, what are your dreams, where you are at? Is there a plan as part of this for you guys to do so? Sure, I, I mean, we, we've been, um, as we discussed today, when we're doing, during demolition and construction and some of the kind of noisy stuff, we went and met with all the neighbors on the street, on Cherry and Bank Street, um, uh, heavily engaged with the school because of all the, the students that are there and uh, you know just we sent out weekly notices to the neighbors about when disruptive activities might be happening and uh, so keeping in touch with the, the real adjacent neighbors and I'm down there almost every single day and I walk the streets and, and check in with everybody and um, they've got my cell phone number they know where I live they have my email and if they have a problem they, they know they can call me and uh, as we get further and further into construction, we'll have, um, you know, more stuff to talk about. You know, we, we do um, um, some, not press releases, but I've been on the radio a few times talking about what to expect. I've been on the, the Channel 3 News giving a little preview of what the summer's uh, looking like. And we're going to keep that up, that interaction up. And uh, there is a 1-800 number posted all the way around the job site. Um, actually rings to my cell phone so if anybody has any questions you call that 1-800 number you got my cell phone and we're happy to meet and review uh, review the drawings and as they as they progress like Tim was saying at one point we really don't even know what we're quite putting in the north building yet but as we know we'll let people know we'll let the community know and uh, so we're, we're wide open for access um, my, my partners are all around every day um, you see about 100 yellow trucks down there. That's Mr. Ireland back here. And uh, he's very accessible. Go to his office at 4 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock at night, and he's there. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, there's a lot of ways to get a hold of us. Yeah, thank you. I mean, to tell you the truth, I think the city council is well um, informed, right? And I'm also very glad to hear about the efforts in engaging the approximative neighbors. Maybe also it could just be a website where some basic informations are, where when the building is, is done, how it's gonna look like, how the interior, so where people can go and see and touch. We do, we do have a website, uh, we update it, and we have uh, Twitter announcements and um, Facebook announcements, that kind of stuff, you know, updated pictures and... Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for being here. Uh, are there, were there, were there, were there any, were there any, um, were there any other counselors who had any comments or questions before we go to a vote? Uh, seeing none, we'll go to, a, well, seeing, See, so seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those, all those in favor of the motion regarding the First Amendment to the second uh, amended and restated development agreement, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. And uh, thank you again for us allowing us to have this conversation by encouraging it to be taken off the consent agenda. Uh, there, the next two items on our deliberative agenda, our entertainment permits. Thank you again, thanks for being here. Um, is the first, it's item 7.2, which is an indoor entertainment permit application for Mothership Vermont. Um, and for this item, I'll go to Councilor Shannon for a motion. Move to approve the 2023-2024 indoor entertainment permit application for Mothership Vermont, 19 Church Street with all standard conditions to include no exemption to the noise ordinance and ask for the floor back very briefly after a second. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, seconded by uh, uh, Councillor Travers. Uh, Councillor Shannon, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, all standard conditions 
includes um, that the noise ordinance is has to be honored, and it always has. Um, in the in the license committee, I just asked that each licensee be made aware because there seems to be a myth that the noise ordinance doesn't apply when we give entertainment permits. But in fact, one of the conditions is that the noise ordinance does still apply. Um, so with each of these, uh, when I make these motions to say it includes no exemption to the noise ordinance, that is not a change. That's part of standard conditions and it's always been there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We we often say standard conditions, and uh, it's important to know what 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 that means. Um, thank you so much. Um, are there any other comments uh, on this motion on this motion before we go to a vote? Uh, seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Which brings us to the second. Um, Entertainment permit, it's 7.3, which is an outdoor entertainment permit application for uh, Junks Tea House. Uh, Councilor Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 outdoor entertainment permit application for Junks Tea House, 324 North Winooski Avenue with all standard conditions, including no exemption to the noise ordinance. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Uh, seconded by Councilor Travers. Uh, any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. And again, our thanks to the members of the License Committee, Councilors Shannon, Grant, and Travers, um, and our Clerk, Lori Olberg, for this work, for your work on this committee. Um, that brings us to the next uh, the next two items, which are regarding appointment of department heads to the, uh, for the city. The first is item 7.04, which is a communication, Mayor Moreau Weinberger, regarding fiscal year 2024 mayoral appointments. And for this item, I'll go to the mayor for some comments, and then we will, then we will go to a motion. Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. I am really excited to be able to bring forward for your consideration and confirmation the outstanding group of department heads that is seated behind me who are each dedicated to the city of Burlington and its, and its residents. <clears throat> the last year has continued to bring exceptionally challenging times for the city, for the country, for the world, um, and we have seen this group continue to forge great progress. I want to call out just a, a few examples of that, and including multi-department projects that are represent major successes of the city, the city of Burlington team. It's certainly not an exhaustive list, and I fear we're probably not going to hit quite everyone who should be recognized. But I think there are ex examples that are illustrative of what this team has continued to do. Construction has begun on the Champlain Parkway. And after a 34-year break and a recent court decision has uh, made clear that, that that construction is going to be able to continue to completion. We are nearing the construction of the Great Streets Main Streets project, which has been a massive collaborative effort led by DPW, but including, including important contributions from CEDO, the Business Workforce Development Department, and Burlington City Arts as well. The opening in February of the Elmwood Community Shelter is very much on my mind, I'm sure yours, after the discussion we had earlier today. And there, too, we had collaborative work between planning, CEDO, parks, and the Burlington Police Department. Our enterprises and utilities continue to make progress, the BED towards our net zero goals, and our water resources towards implementing a new equitable rate structure. And uh, our airport with massive new infrastructure investments there. Um, and we are about, we are just starting to enjoy, um, I don't know if any of you got to be out there this weekend, but the first of many uh, great concerts and activities that are going to be taking place this summer amidst a vibrant, packed summer of downtown programming at the waterfront and City Hall Park and on the marketplace. Um, and across the city. And that includes, of course, uh, Juneteenth, which we are less than two weeks from, 
the Twilight concert series, which began this past weekend, Splash Dance, and the uh, BTV Market, Highlight, July 3rd, Festival of Fools, and the list goes on and on. So <clears throat> day in and day out, it is uh, my privilege to work alongside this exemplary group of public servants. Uh, I know the city benefits their talent, creativity, skill, caring, leadership, and hard work, and it is my distinct honor to submit them for your consideration and confirmation this evening, evening and I hope they will have your, your full support. Thank you, President Paul. Thank you so much, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, with that, we will go to a motion. Um, Councilor Shannon. I proudly and gratefully move to confirm the FY24 mayoral appointments as listed. Thank you so much. Uh, seconded by um, Councilor Bergman. Um, is there any discussion on the motion before us? Seeing, seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion as laid out by Councillor Shannon, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Congratulations to all mayoral appointees. Before we get to before we get to the next agenda item, I'd like to just take a five minute break. Um, we'll be back. It's now um, 9:26. Uh, just a just a minute or so after 9:30. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much and uh, for honoring that break. Um, we now will continue with our deliberative agenda item 7.5 which is a communication Mayor Moreau Weinberger regarding the appointment of a police chief. Um, as with our last item and for this item, I will go to the mayor for some comments and then we will go to a motion. Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. I have one more appointment to bring before you tonight and that, of course, is the appointment of John Murad as the permanent chief of the Burlington Police Department. Uh, I am honored and, and proud to be bringing this appointment forward as well. For anyone wondering why now and why Chief Murad, the answer is simple. Our city needs and deserves a strong and reliable leader in our police department, and we have been fortunate to have one in John Murad for the last three years. From the day he stepped into this office, he has faced tests with little precedent in Burlington. His first summer in the, this role saw large sustained protests outside the front door of 1 North Avenue. The department lost 40% of its officers over its first two years, and 2022 was a year of record high gun violence and two frequent challenges in our treasured downtown. Chief Murad has led from the front through all of this and forged progress in many areas, including priorities that the majority of us here at this table agree on and have supported through resolution after resolution. The chief proposed in the public safety continuity plan in 2020 the creation of CSLs and CSOs and has since recruited, hired, trained, and deployed six CSLs and five, six CSOs and five CSLs who now re respond to close to 25% of all incidents. The chief is on track with the officer rebuilding plan that this council approved last summer, having just celebrated our third graduating class from the academy since this council voted to restore the officer headcount in October of 2021. And the chief has launched a new racial justice training for officers, implemented a new policy on the release of body-worn camera footage of, for use of force incidents, made progress towards the creation of Burlington Cares, a new crisis response resource within the department, and more. Under his leadership, the BPD has arrested suspects in over 80% of the shootings over the last two years. And while we continue to face historic drug overdose, and <clears throat> challenges and housing pressures, downtown Burlington is returning to being the welcoming, vibrant, and safe public space that we have long enjoyed. In short, Chief Murad is delivering progress on the public safety priorities that Burlingtonians, including this council, have demanded. By being on scene at far too many shootings, filling overnight supervisor shifts, and attending countless MPA meetings citywide, often while facing frustrations and criticism, Chief Murad has proven his strong commitment to this great city. 
We have been fortunate that Chief Murad has stepped up during these historically challenging times that have caused so many officers to step away. You know, I remember sitting here on the night of the final debate to restore the officer headcount, and I said then on the cusp of that vote, when I really wasn't quite sure what the outcome was going to be, that a vote for that resolution was a vote for a functional police department, and that a vote against it was going to undermine the functionality of the police department. That is fundamentally the choice before you again tonight. We cannot make the urgent progress the people of Burlington are demanding with our police department and with our public safety challenges without the confirmation of Chief Murad tonight. With this second appointment, I'm making clear that Chief Murad continues to have my full confidence and support in leading our collective efforts to deliver the level of public safety our constituents expect and deserve. I urge you to show the committed team at the Burlington Police Department who put themselves on the line for this community and all Burlingtonians that you too believe in the future of our police department with a yes vote for his confirmation tonight. Thank you, President Paul. Thank you so much, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, so we'll go to a motion to get this started and with that I will go to Councilor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. I move to confirm the appointment of John Murad as Chief of the Burlington Police Department. I'd ask for the floor back briefly after a second. Uh, thank you. So a motion has been made to confirm the appointment of John Murad as our police chief for the coming fiscal year, um, seconded by uh, Councillor Shannon. Um, before I give the floor back to you, just wanted to also note that um, uh, to please keep in mind that our council rules state that no counselor is to speak for more than five minutes to an agenda item. And it is the role of the council president to enforce that rule. Um, please, I am requesting that you keep to this time limit. I have no desire at all to interrupt anyone, as I know that we all give considerable thought to our comments that we, uh, comments that we give to the public. Um, I'll be monitoring and I will encourage you to wrap up if you encroach on the five minute limit. But again, I just please be mindful of it and as I would prefer not to do that. Um, with that, I will go to Councillor Barlow and then we'll open it up to other members of the council to speak. Thank Councilor you, Barlow. I, I promise to be brief. I'll go nowhere near five minutes. I know that there are a lot of other councillors who want to speak tonight and some who may have questions of the uh, acting chief. Um, I first want to say I agree with a couple of speakers tonight they say it's time to move forward with a permanent chief. I think we've had an acting chief for far too long. Um, I also agree with another who spoke tonight who said we're lucky to still have John Murad as acting chief. I'm, I'm glad he stuck around. Um, John has led the department for almost three years through some of the most significant public safety challenges our city has ever faced, at least in my 50 years of living here. And he has done so with a critically understaffed uh, police department. John has met these challenges with an unwavering commitment to the department and to the city. Under his leadership, we have made good progress on the multi-year departmental rebuilding process. We're retooling and, re retooling and restructuring the department to ensure more effective responses to social and mental health needs. And even most recently, we're seeing an improved climate in the downtown for shoppers, diners, and visitors because of an increase, increased BPD presence, a change that has been made possible in part because of our successes increasing the staff levels at BPD under John's watch. More needs to be done, but we're moving in the right direction. I believe John has earned the trust of the community and of the department he leads, and he deserves our support on the council. And I'm hoping that my colleagues tonight will join me in voting for his appointment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Councillor Barlow. So with that, uh, we will open the floor to anyone else who wishes to speak. Um, uh, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, President Paul, I apologize. It's normally my role to invite the, uh, the, the appointee up and, and get some brief remarks from the appointee, and I apologize. I, I failed to do that. I was hoping we could do that now at the beginning of the, the council discussion. Uh, okay. So Chief Mayor, if you come. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam President, um, and, and to the entirety of the council uh, for this opportunity to, to, to talk and to speak. I, I'm going to try to keep it very, very brief because I, I think that the questions uh, that all of you may have are probably more important than what I have prepared. So frankly, I'm 
going to skip through most of it, but I do want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, for your leadership and guidance and support and for leading by example, uh, for compassion for the vulnerable and your desire for collaboration while still getting things done. And I want to say congratulations to the entirety of the city team uh, on your well-deserved reappointments because without your time and energy and, and love uh, you put into your work and our city and our home, it would be a lesser place. And I also want to thank all the people who came tonight, neighbors and colleagues and, and community members, uh, and especially all the people at public comment. And I mean all of the people at public comment because I hear and appreciate the support, but I hear and contemplate the critiques. I serve everyone in this city, and the idea of safe and fair everywhere for everyone is a creed. I want to thank the, the people of the Burlington Police Department, particularly Deputy Chiefs Lebrec and Labarge and Shannon Trammell. I would be nowhere without them, but all of us would be nowhere without the women and the men who do the work in dispatch or in detectives, in records or on the road, in Koozie and in Cape, and every day I feel privileged and proud to get to work with all of them. And most of all, I want to thank my, my parents and my kids, MacArthur and Katie Elizabeth and Bonnie for being here. Um, so I, I had other remarks about accomplishments. It has been three years, 1,089 days, and uh, there's plenty of things of which I am very, very proud, but I don't want to even touch your five minute limit, uh, Madam President, and so I actually will hold on them. Most of them are in the mayor's uh, memo to you. Um, and certainly any opportunity I have to discuss them in the context of questions you may ask, I'll, I'll try to do so. But um, yes, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. And I'll say thank you very much for this chance. Thank you. Uh, so the floor is open. If there are counselors who have uh, questions, uh, we'll go to, uh, to Counselor Carpenter and then Counselor Doherty. Um, Counselor Carpenter. Um, thank you, and thank you, uh, Chief, for all of your service. I know how hard you work. Um, we didn't mention that as us, but it's just incredible to me. I, I told the other, some of the other department heads, um, be careful what you wish for, and I'm going to say that to you, be careful what you wish for, because um, it's a tough job. Um, I've spent a lot of years in government, um, and I retired from government, and it's a messy process, but what... I learned about it is governing in the public sector is, is difficult and very messy. Um, I, I'm, I'm making a couple of comments. I do have a, I'm coming to a question here. Um, my, my comments are in some, um, to, to my colleagues and in the public, it's important to remember that choosing a police chief like choosing our department heads is the prerogative of the mayor to create a cohesive team. The city of Burlington, 20 years ago, um, moved away from a fairly archaic system of department appointments um, under the leadership of former mayors, Bernie Sanders and Peter Clavel, and said, the mayor we elect is the CEO, they need to pick a team. And that is what the mayor is doing tonight, is, is picking a team, and I think that's really important for this council to respect. But um, part of the process and the messiness of um, creating a team is all of these departments come attached with citizen um, commissions, citizen oversight, which means citizen opinion, um, and I think that's critical for this body we need that outside opinion, we need that outside input. Um, and in your case, we need that from our police commission, and in fact, we're looking um, to increase their involvement. But um, we're all kind of aware that there's been some bumpiness with um, the commission, which, which changes, because it is a citizen body, they're not employed. And I guess I'm wanting you to speak and ask about how you see improving relationships and, and your relationship with the police commission. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, I, I believe in the necessity of, of a police commission, the necessity of the involvement of our neighbors in the work that we do. Uh, police legitimacy hinges on, on for me, the, 
there are nine principles that were that came out of England in 1829 and, and sir, from Sir Robert Peel, and one of them is that the police are the public and the public are the police. And, and a citizen police commission gives body to that uh, maxim. Um, I, I recently gave, uh, and during our award ceremony, uh, an award to a former police commissioner in recognition of the importance of that role and the ways in which uh, that is, is incredibly uh, necessary for a police department to have legitimacy. Um, I, I'm heartened by, I, I thought that the most recent police commission was uh, meeting was, was one in which we had a lot of common ground upon which to build. And I'm hopeful that that is going to continue. I think that we have done a lot over the past three years to try to make this relationship a stronger one. We've taken, uh, we, we codified, and, and that happened early in my tenure as acting chief of police. Uh, a, a set of rules for how we work with the police commission with regard to complaints against employees of the Burlington Police Department. Um, codified that, codified much more uh, sharing of information, uh, including body camera footage, giving them their own accounts on our Axon program, which is the platform on which body camera is, is downloaded and then viewed. Uh, there is a lot that to speak to uh, with regard to the, the relationship that exists currently and the system that we have currently, but clearly there are you know things that need to be worked out with regard to uh, certainty about language in the charter, with regard to uh, certainty about what our public wants. I think our public made it clear that there are forms of oversight that are a bridge too far for our public. I think that was made clear in uh, at town meeting day, but there is still a pronounced desire for that kind of involvement, and I recognize the need for that involvement. I don't think a police department can have true legitimacy without it. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Carpenter. We will go to Councilor Doherty. Thanks, President Paul. Uh, I have a question for the acting chief, and then if I might have a, a additional time to make a few comments. Sure, of course. Um, chief Murad, thank you for being here. Um, my question for you is this. Uh, the Burlington Police Department uh, must be committed to developing and implementing fair and unbiased policing practices. In my view, uh, and I believe in the view of my fellow council members, this is absolutely non-negotiable. We do not and will not tolerate a police department that treats people differently based on race, ethnicity, gender, or sexuality. Your critics, and you've heard some of them here tonight, have suggested that you are insufficiently committed to this principle. How do you answer them? And more specifically, what have you done in the past three years to advance fair and unbiased policing practices within BPD? And what do you intend to do in the next year if you are appointed? The existence of bias in every human heart uh, is, I think, something that's indisputable. Uh, we know that these uh, things uh, affect all of us, uh, unconscious biases, uh, overt biases. Uh, we also know that there are long-term and uh, deep-seated disparities and inequalities that have beset our country since before it was founded. Uh, we see it in policing in places. We have seen horrible acts in policing. And I think my first and foremost goal is to ensure that no such act occurs here. Uh, I was, was clear, I, I helped uh, then Interim Chief Morrison articulate her horror at what happened in Minneapolis in, in 2020. Uh, I articulated my own at what happened in Memphis. Uh, with regard to what we have, we have done, um, we have brought in trainers uh, with regard to issues around bias, around cultural competency, around systemic uh, oppression. Uh, we worked with a woman named Trusty Loving, who did a series of iterative trainings with all of our officers, um, and that was uh, even prior to the, the construction of, of training out of uh, the early form of the RAIB. Uh, in the new form of the RAIB, we've since come up with a, a program that I conceived around uh, issues of systemic oppression uh, against people of color, against women, against people based on their sexual orientation, against immigrants. 
uh, and then through the possibilities and protections possible uh, through the 14th Amendment. Uh, I conceived that training. I went to a group called the Center for Policing Equity uh, to help develop that training. Uh, Director Carson of REIB worked on that training as well and, and added to that and helped develop it and then lead it. Uh, and then we delivered that training to every single member of the police department. Um, these are, are things that I, I hit on in internal messaging. I talk to officers about. And furthermore, I, I have tried every single part of, of the transparency efforts that we have undergone in the past several years, uh, putting more directives online, making certain that uh, we are, that I give full information to the police commission in a, the form of a chief's report every month, something that was never done before. And I personally prepare those at great length and, and, and I hope effective effort. Uh, but also in the form of uh, every single use of force. Deputy Chief Lebrec prepares every single use of force as, as a synopsis and presents it to the public. We present an increasing number of those uses of force via body camera footage as well to the public. And the purpose of that transparency is to say where are we with regard to the existence of the disparities that we know are there. The data that we release is the source of the understanding of those disparities. And I, I would not, excuse me, not the understanding, the source of the, the recognition of the existence of those disparities. I want the public to be involved in the understanding of them as well. And to look at, uh, are, are these to be found in the materials that we put forward? Are these to be found in the acts that people themselves can examine? I examine almost every single one of them. Certainly every video that goes out to the public I have watched. Certainly the, the use of force uh, synopses that Deputy Chief Lebrecht prepares, I read. I report on every single use of force against a, that involves a person of color to the mayor within usually uh, 12 hours of when it occurs. So I look into those as well. And what I see is the existence of these disparities in the results and I don't see that disparity is the same as bias. I don't believe that they are the same, and I believe that if we see examples where officer bias is causing these situations, I will absolutely take action on those. Thank you, Chief Murad. Um, President Paul, I, I intend to vote to, to confirm uh, Chief Murad's appointment uh, to the uh, permanent chief position for this one-year position for two principal reasons. Uh, the first, is, is that uh, I echo um, and agree with the remarks made by Councillor Barlow, Councillor Carpenter, uh, the mayor, and so many members of our community uh, who have expressed their views today. Uh, and in short, um, uh, that Chief Murad has led the Burlington Police Department uh, through three years uh, of unprecedented challenges uh, and difficulties um, uh, that I think are uh, uh, totally unprecedented in the history of the city um, and by his leadership and by his commitment to the city uh, he has earned uh, this appointment and earned our trust uh, for this year. Um, my second reason uh, is that I don't think this question can be decided uh, without careful consideration uh, of the consequences of a no vote uh, on this appointment. If the City Council tonight votes against confirming Chief Murad, uh, he will not be blocked from being uh, the police chief, as some have suggested. Uh, in my view, uh, one of two scenarios will follow. One, Chief Murad will continue to serve as BPD's police chief, uh, as he has done for the last three years, um, but with that uh, acting designation. Or two, uh, Chief Murad will decide to seek professional opportunities elsewhere. Uh, if the former, the council, this council, will have sent a message of negativity, instability, and uncertainty to the Burlington Police Department that will further erode the already low morale uh, and worsen our ability to hire and retain qualified officers, which is already a huge challenge in today's environment. If the latter, BPD will be without a qualified leader and I am quite certain that finding a replacement in this environment will be very difficult and an extremely time-consuming process. In my opinion, both of these outcomes will cause further grave damage to the Burlington Police Department and the city's ability to address the public safety crisis. It will also make it more difficult, if not impossible, for BPD to continue to implement 
the essential reforms regarding fair and unbiased policing that the Chief has spoken to tonight, de-escalation practices, the incorporation of CSOs and CSLs into the Department's work. And I think these are unacceptable consequences. So those are my vote reasons for voting yes. But at the same time, Chief, I must also acknowledge that constituents and community members whose opinions I value and respect oppose your confirmation. And the responsibility for building bridges and improving relationships with members of our community, especially those who have been historically mistreated by the police, falls upon the Chief's shoulders. It falls upon your shoulders. This is essential work. A just police department, a fair police department, an effective police department depends upon having the broad support across all segments of our diverse community. So I'd ask you to please view my vote as both a confirmation and a challenge. A challenge to work harder to decrease defensiveness within the department and to improve relationships particularly with those entities and individuals in the community who continue to be critical and distrustful of our police department. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Councillor Doherty. Uh, are there other councillors who wish to speak to this appointment? Uh, we'll go to Councillor Travers and then to Councillor uh, Hightower. Thank you, President Paul, and thank you, uh, Chief, for being here this evening. I also have um, a question and then some brief comments to follow, if that's all right. Um, so, Chief, you, you mentioned it briefly in response to Councillor Carpenter's question here, but um, we've seen in our community over the last few years a number of proposals on community oversight, a number of which we're considering now on our Joint Committee on Oversight and Accountability. And I agree with you that some of the proposals that we've seen are, um, as, as you put it, uh, a step too far. Um, both you and, and I and the mayor and other folks in this council were um, expressed in our opposition to uh, question seven this last town meeting day. Uh, I know that I and others have um, made clear that our opposition to that question does not mean that we are uh, in opposition to any and all forms of community oversight. Uh, as you know, because you've attended the meetings we've had thus far, we, we do have our joint committee now on oversight and accountability. Um, that is continuing to review this issue. I, I appreciate um, your comments, comments on this again in response to Councillor Carpenter, but I'm wondering if you can um, perhaps speak a bit more um, to, to your commitment as the leader of the department to continuing to engage with this council through that joint committee process and oversight and accountability and ultimately before this council on uh, any uh, structural reform measures or additional community oversight measures we're able to come up with that have broader community support. My commitment to engage, I, I think, should be unquestioned. I, I come to every single meeting of these kinds. I participate. Um, I am. Uh, I, I believe that we provide data that we are legally permitted to provide with regard to uh, both the council and the commission. Um, and I prioritize that effort. As I said, uh, for example, the, the chief's report is something into which I put a tremendous amount of work, uh, and that kind of engagement is integral to, to the way that I want to, to be a, a public-facing uh, leader of this department. Um, with regard to commitment to continue to work on, on what we are, are seeking as a community with regard, to, uh, with regard to oversight, with regard to what we have, with regard to ideas for what may come next, uh, I absolutely am committed to being a part of those discussions and and making certain that what's implemented is is fair to the men and women of the police department, uh, is effective for the people who would come forward in the case of complainants, uh, but also in the case of, of other kinds of oversight, uh, such as policy, uh, that creates policies that are workable and reasonable and are things that actually can uh, help the police department function better. Uh, I think to withdraw from that kind of process uh, risks having one that goes ter terrifically and terribly awry. Thank you for that answer, Chief. I know you did not come home to Vermont to be the Chief of Police here in Burlington. Uh, nonetheless, after the unanticipated departure of three of your predecessors under incredibly trying circumstances for public safety personnel around the country, 
Uh, you are left standing at the helm of our police department. I, I work downtown. Anytime I'm otherwise downtown, uh, I know there's a good chance I'll find you there. Uh, you've become a familiar presence in our community, regularly working long shifts seven days a week, personally responding to many calls for emergency assistance. I know you sacrifice irretrievable time away from your family. And with your background and intellect, uh, I know, as others have said, um, that you no doubt have had countless other professional opportunities available to you. You've stuck with Burlington, though, even after uh, your previous appointment was turned down. And I think you're owed a great deal of credit for your dedication and commitment to our city. During your time as acting chief, a generation of police officers uh, hired in the wake of 9-11 have come of retirement age. This transition coincided with a uh, global pandemic and a perfect storm of other crises. Even in the face of these challenges uh, under your leadership, we can see that we're beginning to turn the corner on addressing some of our recruitment and retention challenges. As you know, our current police academy class is one of the largest in recent memory and importantly, I see that that class and other hires at the police department better represent the diversity of our community and I credit you for that as well. With depleted ranks, uh, our police department as well has been able to solve and arrest the perpetrators of our community's most serious crimes and your owed thanks, uh, you and, and your colleagues that, uh, at the police department are owed a great deal of thanks and gratitude for that as this council has expressed by past resolution. I'll tell you, as some other folks here have said, a, a review of my email inbox uh, the past couple weeks and a related apology to those who I haven't been able to respond to yet uh, reveals that while many, many people in our community are supportive of your appointment, um, there are reasonable minds that differ. Uh, I respect the viewpoints of those who disagree on this appointment, but the mayor has put forward a more than qualified candidate. I generally believe our duly elected mayor and future mayors are deserving of their appointments, and that a different conclusion here will set a concerning precedent for the future. Additionally, for the reasons outlined by Councillor Doherty, I'm also deeply concerned that a no vote by this council will further demoralize our police department and deal a significant blow to our efforts to address recruitment and retention. And even though we use this term, permanent chief, I think we all agree that you're not going to be here permanently. None of us are here permanently. Um, and there will come a time when Burlington needs to look for your successor. And how attractive will this job be to a future candidate who sees that uh, the four most recent holders of this position were either terminated, uh, resigned out of frustration with our city council, or were rejected twice by that same council? Uh, I'm very confident in your abilities to serve as our chief of police. Uh, to my colleagues who disagree, I say this. We're voting on a one-year appointment, just as uh, we consider the appointments of your other fellow department heads here this evening. If whoever is mayor at this point next year uh, wants to reappoint you, uh, we'll be sitting here again, uh, voting again, um, again, just as we did for your colleagues this evening. In the interim, uh, I will take my role uh, here on the city council uh, as, as oversight of department heads, both of the police department as well as of the city's other departments seriously. In my position as the co-chair of the uh, council's joint committee on police oversight and accountability, uh, I'm going to continue to work hard on reasonable reforms based on best practices from other communities uh, that will allow for greater community oversight of our police department. As I mentioned at the beginning, I greatly appreciate uh, your being part of those meetings to date. Uh, I am glad to hear from you tonight that you will continue to be a part of those meetings going forward. Uh, thank you for your service to our community chief. Congratulations on your appointment. And I look forward to our continuing to work together. Uh, thank you, Councillor Travers. We'll go to Councillor Hightower. Great, thank you. I don't have any. I don't have any questions for you. I'm just going to have comments because um, I think you already answered my questions um, with Councillor Doherty's question. Um, anyone who follows this council knows that I'm a bit of a sucker for compromise, and I also regret that this has become a political issue. I don't blame the politicization of this on Acting Chief Murad or anything that he has done or hasn't done, but on the mayor. I find no pleasure in 16 months later reiterating the reasons I cannot vote for Acting Chief John Murad yet. I wish that the mayor had found a pathway to compromise as that pathway has been clear and open for 16 months. For me, a compromise is to say that Acting Chief Murad can be police chief once he has met the criteria that we set in the job description. 
What I saw in the job descriptions were requirements for commitment to and leadership in transformation 21st century policing. This means not using broken windows policing, not trying to explain, but rather acknowledging and addressing discrepancies and bias in the police department and supporting citizen oversight. I really don't understand how we can in 2022 still support any department head who doesn't think their department and clear discrepancies we see in their day it is, um, is affected by bias, not just something in the heart and heart of the individuals of the department, but systemically and in the outcomes of the department. For me, this is not negotiable. I'm not opposed to the fact that Acting Chief Muran hasn't let the way on oversight, but that he is someone in this room that seems to be opposed to additional oversight of the police department. I asked the mayor over a year ago to work with the chief to first take responsibility for the discrepancies in use of force and other data points and to make a plan to address them. I ask that the chief, at minimum, support the mayor's version of oversight, which includes at least a removal in the charter of the chief as the sole disciplinary authority. These are my requirements for supporting a chief. I found the acting chief on this to be more conservative than even the police union at times. This is not the beginning of building trust, and it's not in line with the pillars of transformative and 21st century policing. Tonight we have heard again clear articulated issues on how he responds to questions or criticism or how he responds to other authority figures. I am sorry that those are things that I keep getting brought up in public forum. That is a very difficult way to bring these up. But taking accountability is not explaining these away, it's not getting defensive, and it's not bullying others when they do not comply. A lot of people spoke to the fact that we haven't had a council appointed chief since 2019. I feel like that means we have to remind people why we haven't had an appointed chief since then. The chief we did have initially had a fake social media account that he used to troll activists. The next interim chief did the same. The mayor has chosen over and over again to keep these issues away from the public or even the council, something we saw most recently with the altercation between Acting Chief Merritt and an attending doctor at UVM. We have an ongoing culture problem in the department and we don't have a plan for addressing it. I understand why the department is defensive. There's been a lot to be defensive about. Um, there was a lot of anger, some of it deserved and some of it reactionary in 2020 and beyond. But this council, and certainly myself, have always been willing to compromise and to extend olive branches. It's time to work on building trust, but that requires work on both sides. I think the only way we're going to see change on community safety, safety for all community members, not just some, is to rebuild trust. You cannot rebuild trust without first taking accountability. Another of my ask of the mayor 18 months ago was that we have the acting chief go through training or coaching to reduce or eliminate the complaints and issues we had seen around the response to questions, feedback, dissent, or rightful and willingness to comply. That was in January 2021, before we even had the issue with the attending physician. We have all had our flaws, and wouldn't it be better to make a plan to address them rather than to pretend they don't exist? It is not that I do not support Acting Chief Muran as police chief, and I am truly grateful for your service. You work harder, as harder, harder than any department chief that, that any department had that we have. However, I cannot support you under this mayor, who also has a lot of work to do on building trust and transparency. I cannot support this without an improvement plan or without robust citizen oversight in place. I'm also glad that Acting Chief Murad has the support of his officers and the business community, but that was not the part of the community that felt that trust was broken. If we are to rebuild trust, we need to have a chief that is interested and capable of increasing transparency, transparency, de-escalation, and trust. Right now, Acting Chief Murad does not seem to have the tools to make that happen. So I will be voting no, and I regret having to make this statement again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Uh, we don't have any other councillors who wanted to speak. Uh, Councillor King. Uh, thanks, President Paul. I will be voting yes on the confirmation of John Murad's appointment as permanent chief. I'd be remiss if I didn't explain how I came to this conclusion. It has been my belief that our community deserves public safety systems that are compassionate, effective, and forward-thinking. There is no doubt that there has been a division on issues related to policing and public safety generally. These issues will take time and effort to be resolved. I also recognize that many of my neighbors experience policing in different ways than I have. I prioritized meeting with the acting chief after being sworn in. During that meeting, through conversations with a wide range of constituents, and after considering the implications of alternatives, 
I concluded that the responsible leadership decision would be to support this appointment. While meeting with the acting chief, I asked a number of questions relating to his views on police accountability, what he sees as his faults, and the future of public safety in Burlington. I also have been meeting with current and former police commissioners to hear about their experience working with the acting chief and their views on public safety in our neighborhoods. The police commission provides invaluable time and work on behalf of the Burlington community. I appreciate and respect their service and knowledge and have considered that input I received from them in making my decision. We have a lot of work to do as a community and city to ensure all neighbors feel comfortable with our public safety model. That is work that will take time and I hope we can all remain committed to the process. I believe the next step in doing that work is confirming John Murad as permanent police chief. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor King. Uh, are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this appointment? Confirmation, I should say. Uh, Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. I, um, I find it unfortunate that we're <clears throat> in this position again uh, a little over a year after we had the same conversation. And um, I don't think anything has changed since we had that conversation last January. In fact, I think we have seen uh, a number of concerns arise that only add to my apprehension in supporting this appointment. Um, I cannot support Acting Chief Murad at this time without what Councillor Hightower outlined as an improvement plan, uh, a clear outline of how we're gonna move forward to address the concerns that so many in our community have shared and many probably didn't even show up tonight because it feels like a futile effort because they feel like their voices are not heard in this room. And I don't blame them because there have been several times where I have felt like my own voice isn't heard in this room. And I don't know how many more times uh, we can continue to have these same conversations and have this divisive, combative posture between the council and the administration. It's certainly not what I wanted when I ran for council. It's not what I wanted or expected when I sat at this table for the first time. But there have been many nights in this room where we have fought for no reason other than petty political disputes. And so I don't feel the need to reiterate the statements that others have made or reiterate the concerns that I shared in January of 2022. And uh, I guess I will just say that this, my, vo my voting no tonight is not a reflection of the members of the police department or the work that they're doing. It is a disagreement with the way in which this appointment was brought forward and a lack of respect for the very real concerns that a lot of people have in our community and members of this council have shared. And so I, I will be voting no tonight and uh, I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor McGee. We'll go to Councillor Bergman. Uh, well, first, uh, I, I think that anybody who's listening and looking can read the tea leaves or look at the votes and see that the parade of horribles will not take place as a result of the action that is going to be taking, that's going to be happening tonight. I do believe that you will uh, be appointed tonight. Um, and I want to thank you for hard work that, that you've done. People have said that and I acknowledge that. Um, 
We have heard lots of comments on both sides. And to me, that's exactly a reason why I am um, not in favor of going forward with this appointment tonight. And I say that as somebody who congenitally agrees that the chief executive officer should be able to appoint their uh, department heads. Um, but the advice and consent process uh, sometimes doesn't lead to, uh, to that result. And uh, over the many years, decades that I've seen this happen, I've, I've witnessed that. Um, despite claims by, um, by several uh, tonight, um, we have been making progress on recruitment and, and, and retention. Others here have acknowledged that um, under an acting chief regime. And I continue uh, to believe that consensus is what we really need to be striving for. And we are actually building on a host of things. The CSOs are an example of that, although I personally believe that we've been moving too slowly in that regard. But we are making progress on that. Um, the, the, the problem that I, that I see is that the move to bring this appointment now sets us back, is divisive in an unnecessary way. Um, you will, regardless of what would have happened tonight, you will continue to be the chief, and I will work with you as the chief, regardless of what happens, and I believe that I have worked with you in honesty, good faith, and integrity, um, and uh, I will continue to, to act in that regard, um, because the, the public safety of my constituents um, and of this city is, is deeply important to me. Um, but my concern that this has been brought forward um, as a wedge issue um, is, um, is, is real. And I think that the progress that we need to make in terms of some personal things, and we've heard that, I don't need to repeat that, and also a uh, commitment to the type of public safety uh, system needs to go f much further to have gotten my um, yes vote tonight. So I will uh, not be supporting um, the, um, the elevation of uh, Chief Murad to being the uh, appointed chief of police. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. Um, are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this confirmation? Okay, well, we'll, okay, we'll go to Councillor, we'll go to Councillor Jang and then to Councillor Shannon. Um, thank you, President Paul, and thank you, Chief Mirad, for being here and congratulations to all the department heads. Um, you know, I think it was four years ago, it was around this time, and I made a request to divide the question because the mayor wanted to appoint all the department heads together. I had the courage to stand up and ask the chief of police back then to not be appointed. And I was only, actually there were only two votes. So meaning that I, I wanna do what's best for the city. And I also don't want any type of backroom dealing. I want us to be transparent and do our job the best, to the best of our, to the, to the best of our abilities. Appointing Chief Mirad, uh, acting Chief Mira today does not definitely solve the public safety crisis in the city of Burlington. I choose the word crisis 
because when we rely on the state police to patrol our streets, it's a crisis. When we witness people killing each other in broad daylight in city parks, it's a crisis. And we're not immune to that yet. What is happening to Burlington, as you all know, is similar to what we observe all over Vermont and even nationally, right? We are in a public crisis era. No single issue, as you all know, is more important um, to the member of the community about, than public safety. The most important issue that we all hear every single day. And as leaders, it is so important for us to understand the complexity and the nuances of the current situation in the city of Burlington so that we can identify the solution collaboratively and that is best suited in addressing the challenges we face. Murad has done well in so many different areas. Murad has solved crimes in this city and heriting this department. Murad is working to rebuild the department. To tell you the truth, two years ago, three years ago, I was here and I voted in support of Murad. And I still trust that he wants to do better. But he needs help. He needs support from every single one of us in order for him to be successful on the job. But is Murad definitely willing to do better? Is he willing to improve in critical areas that we desperately need, such as rebuilding trust between community members, between the community and the police, right? Is Murad ready to uh, rebuild our community? Has he demonstrated that over the past three years? Is Murad interested in really diversifying the police workforce? I mean, from the perspective of the sworn police officers, the diversity that we talk about, is he? Is Murad really ready to demonstrate respect and collaboration of the people that he worked with, even though those disagree with him? Is Murad ready to demonstrate an adequate service delivery to all people, regardless of their race, their background, or who they love. Murad has that responsibility. The responsibility to prove to Burlington that he can make progress on all of those that I mentioned earlier. He, he needs to bring it. But this is not about Murad. I think some of us did talk about that. But this is more about the chief executive officer of the city of Burlington. This is about the mayor. The mayor has the sole power to bring whoever he wants to put him on the job and for us to react. We reacted before Murad continued to do his job and to improve in some areas. But now the question that I have is some of us definitely do want to support Murad, but they want to see, let's say, an improvement plan. We heard it, all of us, right here. An improvement plan, and I think that is not private anymore, and this is public. It is, it is a public request from us, as collaborators, to work with the mayor. But now, will the mayor consider seeking that improvement plan around narrowing the community divide that we've been experiencing since 2020 from the acting chief, Mirad. And this is a question that I have for Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, President Paul. Uh, certainly, if there, uh, Mayor Weinberger, do you have a response to that? <clears throat> Councilor Jang, uh, the, 
chief and I go out and do our best every day to make the right calls and improve public safety in this community and we firmly believe that part of improving public safety is uh, building trust and accountability, that part of public safety is uh, re refining, improving, codifying our oversight system. The chief has, I think, arguably worked more than any uh, other chief to uh, improve that system, make good on uh, the idea that our police commission, the police commission today is a far different commission and the, the way in which the department is engaging it, supplying information, uh, sharing, uh, uh, ensuring that complaints are reviewed and that use of force interactions are reviewed. It's very different than it was in 2019. That has happened with Chief Murad's le leadership. All of us, uh, we, we agree that there's more work to be done to uh, codify that system and and get it right. Um, so uh, we um, we are committed to doing all that. We're committed to making good on the principles of 21st century policing reform, which have long guided this department, <coughs> while also facing severe resource cons constraints and also facing uh, the uh, most challenging public safety environment that the city has seen in a long time. So um, we're committed to that improvement that you're speaking about and trying to make good on it every day. If there's specific things that you would like to, as a counselor, work with the, the, the mayor's office and the chief about, I'm happy to have further conversations with you about it. Um, um, thank you. I mean, I think I asked a question and I did not hear an answer. Um, and, you know, it is unfortunate that, yes, you will be appointed here tonight, but with some people voting no, right? But I will take the commitment of continuing to work with you about that improvement, right? Even just as a one single city councilor who care deeply about this city about how do we rebuild the trust, especially between the chief and the commission, the chief and people of color in this community. I make that commitment. You'll have my vote tonight as I voted for you before, but um, yeah, and I know that you can be successful. And I hope that everyone, whether you vote yes or vote no for him, to continue to um, challenge him to do better for the people of the city that care deeply about uh, the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Jang. We'll go to Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. And thank you, Chief, for sticking with us. I honestly do not know where this city and this department would be if you had chosen not to step up or to leave. And anybody in your position, and I'm sure including you, has options, and options that probably would have been more lucrative, would have been easier for you, and easier for your family, and you chose to stick with us. Um, I really can't thank you enough for that. Uh, I will vote tonight for you because I believe in you. I believe in your integrity. I believe in your humility. I believe in your commitment. And it's all been demonstrated without a doubt. Um, and I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Um, but we need to stabilize our police department. And this vote tonight is about stabilizing the police department. It's about the message we send to the department. It's about whether or not we tell the department that the city council has your backs, that the city council is going to support the department. And I know that it, uh, it took some time for you to win the confidence of your department when you uh, started here coming from New York City that was not the case. 
and you have worked to earn that trust and that loyalty from your department. And because you did, you were able to get people to stay. That is essential. Without that, we don't have a police department. Um, you have served for three years as police chief under a microscope. Many have pointed out, I have served 20 years. And many have pointed out, perhaps too long, but nonetheless, that gives me more history than anybody at the table except for, I think, Councillor Bergman. Um, I, I, you, policing has never been under the microscope that it is currently. Um, but the police chief has certainly never been under this kind of microscope. And when we put anything under the microscope, we will find its flaws. Oftentimes, I always say, a person's worst characteristic is also their best characteristic. And we marry the person who we can tolerate the bad side of that coin and love the good side of that coin. I appreciate that you had the humility to apologize for your actions up at the hospital. And I also appreciate that you were there and that in that moment there was a conflict between the interests of the doctor, whose interest was solely the patient, and your interest, which was our public safety and uh, and fighting to find out who the shooter was, a shooter who in fact went on to shoot two more people after that night. And it was your goal to stop that from happening. And I appreciate your efforts. So when we look under the microscope, we see it all. Um, I am not looking for a perfect diamond, nor would we ever find one. And whatever candidate might come forward uh, if we were to not appoint you or at some later date, we will never know that candidate's flaws to the extent that we know yours because everybody has them. Um, I think you've stood up well under the pressure uh, and I don't think we can hold out for a perfect diamond or a unicorn. And I hope that this council will strongly give their support tonight. Um, and I am very grateful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Um, Councillor Grant. I just want to say it's really inappropriate to victim shame a complainant. It takes a lot of courage. Um, to make complaint against the police. And we know this, and there are a lot of people, because I've talked to them, I talked to them during my campaign, who don't have that courage because they feel that they'll be targeted in some way. And I think um, we just heard an example of that, and I would like us to do better. This is very difficult for me. Um, uh, it's pretty well known that um, Acting Chief Murad and I haven't had the best relationship. Um, I, quick background, I started on the committee to review policing policies after I viewed the body cam footage and read the court filing for the Millie Brothers lawsuit against the city. I am very happy that that's been resolved. I feel it helps to, helps to lift a dark cloud on our department. I would like to see the Jock case um, also resolved. I don't agree that we should be trying to appeal Judge Sessions' ruling in that. Um, I don't want to go off on a tangent there. I will say this, uh, you know, improvement that I have seen. Let me start with that. When we talk about recognizing the community's participation and reimagining community safety. I've heard better language um, coming from you, and I appreciate that. So for example, 
uh, giving credit to people in the community who uh, first brought the CAHOOTS model that we are going to be looking to implement. I think there was a period of time that, yes, you helped with the RFP, yes, you would, you would be helping to implement it, but there wasn't credit where credit should have been due, and I hear you doing that now. Um, CSOs and CSLs, these, these uh, additional positions to improve our community uh, responses. You know, this is very community driven as well. I feel at times that even though now you embrace them, it was like dragging, you know, pulling teeth to, to get you on the, to the same page in terms of reimagining public safety. I appreciate that you did a program with the Center uh, for Police Equity. Uh, racial disparities in the city have been of grave concern to me, considering that I am in uh, representing a district and live in a district that is the most diverse uh, racially and economically. And we are a district where we have not been policed the same. And when you aren't policed the same and you don't get the help that you need, uh, and this is previous to COVID, previous to the accelerated um, resignations, you, you have uh, feelings, right? You have that lack of trust. You have that lack of, of faith in the, in the process. You know, when people are called and they're trying to get help um, and they're told, well, what do you expect because of where you live? And I know the mayor has heard this from people as well. I go to the mayor's coffees. I've tried to advocate for people in my community who have experienced that. We were not treated the same. And it's a huge issue. And the racial disparities are a huge issue. But I appreciated that work with the Center of Police Equity. I wish, though, that you had opened yourself to what their normal process would have been. There was this need that you had to control that process. And I think that the department would have been better served if they would have been able to come in, be allowed to look at the data, and then say, here's what we recommend for you. So I appreciate what you did because it's definitely better than nothing and we definitely need to have this issue addressed. Um, but the, the, this need to control and, and the defensiveness doesn't serve you well. It doesn't serve us well. It doesn't serve our officers well. And I think at times when you've gotten so defensive, that's when that's when things get really tough, for lack of a, a better way to put it. Um, a few things. I feel, despite being advised many times that you were really slow to understand the extent of the drug crisis in Burlington and how it was driving specific types of incidents such as larcenies and car thefts, um, uh, not to mention the increase in overdoses, which now into 2023 have increased further. I personally, as a police commissioner, based on my interactions with my community, was trying to say we need to be advising people that these increase in crimes of opportunity, crimes of, of poverty, were increasing dramatically in wards two and three. We have always been the canaries in the coal mine with regards to certain types of crime. We've had certain types of crime that occurred in our area more than other areas. So we we're used to these things. We were used to spring upticks, but we were seeing something very, very different. And I tried multiple times to communicate that. And I was told that there was nothing to, that would show that that was any indication that that was getting worse. And there are recorded meetings in which these conversations happened. So that was very frustrating for me because it continued to accelerate it continued to branch out even further into the rest of the city, in particular our downtown business district. Simple things like what you now do, but could have been doing 
last spring about letting people know they needed to lock their property, letting people know they couldn't be um, casual about leaving doors unlocked or leaving keys in cars. We don't have sophisticated crime rings. We literally have these cars being used for shelter and substance abuse. I find the house hospital complaint uh, where you threatened to arrest a doctor and interfered with care being provided as, as disqualifying. I found it to be an abuse of power and I found it to be unnecessary. I also felt that it set a very poor example for our officers. Like what are we showing our officers in terms of how they have to um, interact with individuals? This cost our officers social currency because now you have these people at the hospital and they have been, the, the fact that it took so long to come out was amazing to me because people at the hospital had been talking about this. I feel that we can't show our officers that bullying and intimidating people is a way to, to get or secure information. You know, there's hard questions about, you know, witnesses who weren't hurt, why weren't they cooperating with the police? That's, that's part of the community trust that we still have to be working on in certain parts of our community. Um, I appreciate that you made an apology, but it, it's, it's still not the behavior of a leader. Uh, going back to concerns of racial disparities and a lack of equity in policing, this has been, for lack of a better description, almost an ongoing battle. Um, I feel if there had been, the CNA recommendation said simply, to accept the possibility that bias played a role in the racial disparities. The data uh, that was presented last year was very clear. In the case of violent incidents, there are no racial disparities, but in the case of non-violent incidents, those disparities have continued. In trying to explain and, and justify some of the use of force incidents and I was trying to talk to you about your language, that you had to be more conscious of how you spoke about certain people in our community. Um, especially about our black and our new, new American uh, community so that we would not be seen as, as criminals, that we were already stigmatizing some of our new American youth. And that was um, very concerning. We had the infamous press release where we had a picture of a new American youth. And then that was followed by all the crime statistics uh, year to date. Um, it really affected a lot of people in the community. A lot of youth were very upset about that and they definitely felt targeted. You know, and, and as I uh, tried to explain to you last May, I mean, so a year now, and also in the last June meetings, um, that's, that's when things really changed for me where I think our relationship became even more fraught hmm. because you asked me, a black woman, if I cared about black on black crime. And that was astounding coming from someone who was denying uh, racial uh, disparities. I am almost finished, I appreciate it. Um, so that to me is still a huge concern because that was really insensitive on so many levels. I do feel that um, you have not supported the police commission and you do not fully support oversight and accountability. And you also said in an open meeting that was recorded that there's a perception that the work of the police commission was discouraging lateral transfers from applying to BPD. Um, you did not say what you were doing or what you could do to fight that perception. And it was deeply concerning because then it made uh, some people in the community feel like, well, what type of officers are we looking to hire if they don't care about oversight and accountability? And then finally, we hear a lot of talk about uh, 21st century policing, but the average person doesn't know what the pillars are of 21st century policing. So they don't really know if, if we're li living up to that 
these ideals, and I would say in some instances we're not. Um, I don't think our officers have been always served when it comes to these battles on the police commission about oversight and accountability, you know, when we're asking to confirm extra coaching or extra training. It's not issues of punishing people, quote unquote. It's Councilor Grant. Yeah. I my apologies. No, no, know. that's okay. That's okay. Um I, I have to leave it there and I'm obviously a no vote. And I don't think we should make decisions based in fear. Thank you. Th thank you, Councillor Grant. Um, we've gone through one round. Um, Councillor Travers. Um, well, just noting the time, President oh, Paul, yes. I would just uh, move uh, to suspend our rules and allow for the completions of items seven and eight, the deliberative agenda and committee reports. Uh, okay, so a motion. We have come to well beyond the magic hour of 1030. Um, so the motion is to suspend our rules to complete the deliberative agenda um, and item number eight, committee reports? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councillor Hightower. This requires a two-thirds vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion to suspend our rules to commit to complete our deliberative agenda and item number eight, which is committee reports, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, so that passes and um, we will continue with our deliberative agenda and item number eight. My apologies for letting us get way beyond um, uh, the 1030 hour. Uh, are there any other counselors who wish to speak to this confirmation? Uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. Um, appreciate all of the discussion t tonight and, and the um, uh, perspectives on, on both sides of this issue and, and certainly not going to try to, to respond to uh, uh, all the concerns that have been raised or the criticism made, but there are, there are, are two points that I, I do think um, are worthy uh, that, that, that I should give some response to. And, um, one is th this, uh, it was suggested that um, I'm bringing forward Chief Murad uh, to introduce a, 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 a wedge political issue or something to that effect. Um, no, uh, I brought Chief Murad forward uh, a year ago, over a year ago, because we had been searching for a chief for a long time. I was felt it was critical that we have stability at the top of the police department. And Chief Murad had come through that extensive search process as uh, clearly a qualified chief. Um, I was very clear at the time with the council that my con there were calls for continued searching and I felt that we could no longer do that. I feel um, looking back on that, it, that it was one of my better decisions based on what came, what was about to come at us in 2022. Had we not had stable leadership at the depart top of the department as we faced uh, the most challenging public safety year that certainly I've experienced, I think the city maybe has ever experienced, uh, we would have been in even greater uh, trouble than we had, than we are. Um, that is still my reasoning for why I'm bringing forward uh, Chief Murad. I still think we have major public safety challenges and, and that, that hasn't changed. Um, I have a responsibility under the charter to bring forward appointments every year. Um, I'm a little surprised at the notion that uh, I think was suggested that you wish that there just had been, that we had, had continued on the acting capacity uh, th through another year. Um, I think there would have been concerns about that too if I had taken that course. I think this is a better course to get to a permanent chief. Um, there was also a statement made that nothing, uh, so in, nothing, nothing has, has changed since early 2022. And um, I do think the fact that we need a permanent chief, again, that has remained consistent. That has not changed, but uh, a lot else has. The chief 
uh, amidst a historic um, loss of officers has introduced a rebuilding plan and has real momentum with delivering on it. We, we experienced in 2022 the worst gun violence this city, I believe, has ever seen. And the, chief, the department under the chief's leadership responded to that violence with outstanding police work again and again and has come a long way towards getting that violence under control. We have seen a, we saw the most challenging downtown climate that the city has seen in a long time, putting many of our beloved local businesses uh, to, to the edge of their ability to continue functioning in this downtown, not consistently able to be, deliver what downtown Burlington has so long been. Um, uh, and the chief, and we see in this year, has responded to that and, and has rolled out a plan that is having a real impact on that. And another thing that's changed since the beginning of 2022 is that the voters have shown us with increasing urgency that they want us to address all these problems and more. They want us making good on the principles of 21st century policing on top of those priorities that I just listed. And they, uh, they are impatient for action and change. I believe this is one of the uh, votes that there is s strong public support for as well. The people of Burlington, by a large margin, want a permanent chief of police. They know we need one right now, and they know Chief Murad has earned this job, and I hope the council will be validating that shortly. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, seeing no others in the queue, uh, we will go to a vote. Um, and I believe it probably would be best if we did that by roll. Uh, Lori, if you could call the roll, please. Councillor Barlow? Yes. Councillor Bergman? No. Councillor Carpenter? Yes. Councillor Jang? Yes. Councillor Doherty? Yes. Councillor Grant? No. Councillor Hightower? No. Councillor King? Yes. Councillor McGee? No. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Travers? Yes. City Council President Paul? Yes. Eight ayes, four nays. Uh, eight, I, eight in favor and four opposed. Uh, that motion, that's that. Thank, thank you, if you could just let us finish. Um, uh, so the motion passes. I would like uh, to just take a, a few moments of, of perhaps privilege here um, and just in, a little bit of indulgence with, um, with others on the count, with, with my colleagues on the council to just offer a couple of words. Um, and I think that, you know, as a body, we all recognize that public safety, meaning keeping everyone in our community safe, uh, is a solemn commitment and it's the highest priority. I mean, I hear this all the time from constituents that they're important, they, they want their sidewalks and they want their, their roads and they want their bike lanes, but they want public safety. And public safety means keeping everyone safe. Uh, I've had many conversations over the last couple of days with, with my colleagues. And I truly believe that regardless of our vote tonight, that many of us, really all of us, are eager to work with you in good faith. We want to support and we want to partner with you. But this must be an open exchange. And partnership means that we both commit to this work, that we value each other even when we disagree. Uh, I, I think that we all want to support you and to see you rise to the challenges that you know exist. And that, you've, and that you've heard this evening, challenges that you know must be addressed. And I always go back to what I know by profession. Um, as an auditor, one of the first things that you learn, um, uh, one of the first tenets in auditing is you always look for the tone at the top. 
And that means the message that you, as the chief, convey to others. The tone that you convey to the people you work with, the tone that you convey to department heads, to other city employees, to this council, to our community. And like each of us who commits to public service, I think that public trust is paramount. You can't govern without trust. Um, public trust also has to be earned, and it's a precious commodity. Um, you know, it's like a person's reputation. It takes a long time to build a reputation, and it can take seconds to tear it down. So it's a valued, a valued asset. Um, I think that being held accountable means being held accountable to the highest standards. And I hope and I do believe that you will listen to our community, to everyone in our community, and be positive to collaborate, not only to rebuild our force, which we all know is, is hard work, and we all appreciate the work that you have done, but also to restore trust so that we're all safe, and, that remem and to remember that if we can all work together respectfully, that we can go far and do as the community expects and deserves. Um, accountability and oversight can be a positive. They are not to be feared. They are at the heart of restoring trust. And in the end, that trust can be the embrace that binds us in a common goal of transformational and broadly accepted public safety. Um, with that, congratulations, Chief Murad. Um, congratulations to you, to your family, and to our community. The next four items um, on our agenda are public hearings and the votes that follow each hearing. Uh, the first item is 7.06, which is a public hearing regarding uh, Burlington Downtown Tax Increment Financing District substantial change request. And we do have uh, uh, our TIF consultant, David White, joining us online. Um, not only should there be any questions from community uh, members, uh, but also, uh, David, I believe that you would like to speak, um, request very briefly, if at all possible. Um, we would welcome your comments at this time, and then we will go to the public hearing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, President Paul. Um, so I will keep my comments brief. I think we're all tired and ready to uh, uh, make, call it an evening. So this public hearing is with regard to the downtown uh, TIF district and uh, specifically with regard to a proposed application to the Vermont Economic Progress Council, also known as VEPSI. Um, for what's called substantial change. Now, I will caution you that's their term. In fact, I think in this case, we're not proposing any substantial changes. In fact, quite the reverse. Uh, we aren't proposing any new debt. We're not proposing any new projects. This is more of a procedural uh, uh, application. Um, at the, under the state statute and rules, we are required to, each every municipality, not just Burlington, is required to return to VEPSI at the end of the period of time during which they, uh, the municipality is allowed to incur a new debt. Burlington reached that deadline at the end of March. And so by statute, we're obligated to go back and uh, have a meeting with them to both uh, give them a, a view of what the finances look like for the remaining life of the TIF district now that we know what all the debt service will be 
um, and uh, uh, to have a discussion with them around the question of whether there should be an adjustment with regard to how much of the, what percentage of incremental taxes continue to be retained in the TIF district, both education and municipal taxes. So that's the core purpose of this return. It's something that's statutorily required. The second key purpose is that there's been an ambiguity and misunderstanding or disagreement between the city and VEPSI with regard to the use of an annual development fee that's being paid by Champlain College um, as part of an agreement between the city and Champlain College for their uh, Eagles Landing project on St. Paul Street. And for the first four years, the city used those funds to help rebuild City Hall Park, and VEPSI believes it should have gone into the TIF fund. I won't delve into a lot of detail. That's in the materials that's been provided to you. Um, but we are proposing as a result of this to um, use funds to, to make the question moot on that Champlain College uh, point. Uh, by taking funds, the city at the time that it issued the debt for the downtown TIF district um, was able to negotiate with the uh, for uh, with regard to the bond was able to negotiate um, uh, some uh, a bond premium additional monies that are more than enough to cover the uh, amount of uh, debt or the amount of uh, excuse me uh, Champlain College fees that are in dispute. And we're proposing to simply use those funds to directly pay for some of the costs in the TIF district. Uh, so that's part of the proposal. With regard to the statutory obligation to discuss the question of how much, uh, of what percentage of taxes get retained. At this point, our proposal to VEPSI is that um, we do not modify those because we, there are still enough things that are uncertain going forward. Uh, but that we uh, check in with them on an annual basis for the remaining life of the TIF district and when and if it becomes clear that there is more uh, funds going into the TIF district than are required to pay debt service and related costs, that then we could look at adjusting the retainage and that that would happen on an annual basis. Um, the application also provides just a general update in terms of finances, uh, provides uh, more details than we had last time we spoke with FEPSI with regard to the specifics for design. Um, and uh, I think and it, the design for the Main Street, Great Streets project, which is the, the remaining major project or only make the remaining project for the downtown TIF district, and also the schedule and budget for that. So that's the gist of the application and the sum of my overview. Happy okay. to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks for being here at this late hour. Um, we will, with that, we will open the public hearing. If there is any member of the public who wishes to speak to this substantial change request, um, I'll go back to Zoom. You can just simply use the raise hand function, um, or for those who are in Contois, Simply raise your hand and we will, we will call on you. Um, I'll just look and see if there's anyone who wishes to speak that's joining us online. Um, and we'll keep the public hearing open. Uh, there doesn't appear to be anyone who wishes to speak. Um, going once, going twice. Uh, we will close the public hearing and move on to item 7.7, .7, which is the substantial um, change request uh, to VEPSI, the Downtown Tax Increment Financing District. Um, and I would entertain, uh, I would enter, entertain a, uh, the a motion to, um, to approve the recommended action. Uh, Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Carpenter. If you could uh, please read the recommended action. Yep. I would move to approve the city's substantial change request to VEPSI for its downtown TIF district and authorize the city council president Karen Paul 
and Chief Administrative Officer Catherine Shad to execute the attached formal request letter. Th thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Seconded by Councillor King. Um, is there any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you again, David, for joining us. Uh, the next Thank you I all. The next item on our agenda is 7.8, which is a public hearing regarding the setting of common area fees for uh, the fiscal year 2024. Um, and for that, we actually, uh, we do have one member of the public that I'm aware of who wishes to speak during public hearing. Um, and with that, we will open the public hearing. Um, Mark, please, please come up and join us. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for your patience and waiting for us to get to this item. The floor, the floor is yours. We'll open the, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I appreciate that you all do this as often as you do. Um, thank you. I also appreciate what Jim and his team and what Kara does for Church Street and uh, the block that we reside on as Outdoor Gear Exchange. I'm here representing Bigger Boat. We own the building and Outdoor Gear Exchange. We rent from ourselves, but so essentially representing our business. Um, over the past five years, I'm also appreciative of the decisions made to waive Church Street Marketplace fees during the pandemic or for the first four quarters of the pandemic um, and that the rates have not gone up in that time and I can understand why there's a desire to raise the rates right now. Um, I'll take this moment to state that I feel the Church Street Marketplace, fee marketplace fees, while important, are a form of double taxation. Um, we pay over $40,000 a quarter in real estate tax, which is designed to support everything that the city does, including public works. Yet we also pay another $17,000 a quarter just to cover the public works for our block. Um, I'm sure that there are many residents in Burlington who do not have children yet pay school tax because they believe that well-educated uh, children are an important part of our society and important to our city. Um, I think we all agree that Church Street is one of the crown jewels of our Queen City and I'm proud to be an anchor tenant on the block. I'm also proud of what Church Street represents and how I speak fondly of it to many of my colleagues who work in businesses in Boulder, which was designed by the same architect. And it's obvious to those who have been to both places. So first off, I don't really think that there should be a Church Street marketplace fee. I think it should be incorporated into the city budget as part of the grand list taxes. That would be fair. We contribute to the value of the city. We contribute to the increased value of everyone's property when business is good. And we, as one of the retail business, contribute to the tax rolls through our local option tax collected on non-clothing goods that we sell. Uh, with regards to the increase, if we can't eliminate the tax or the fee, I would propose not having an increase until we can resolve this issue of double taxation. Over the last three years, starting our I guess over the last six years, starting with the um, demolition of the mall, which needed to happen, and the subsequent discussions over what was happening next, and the now progress that I'm seeing, we have seen a significant impact to the traffic in our business. Our traffic this year is down, um, in many cases, 20% year over year, um, and that doesn't seem to me all that different from what I'm seeing on Church Street in all but the busiest days. Um, the issues that um, now Chief Murad has been dealing with, that we've all been seeing downtown, have impacted our business traffic, and those are impacting all of us. So I would just implore this group to reconsider whether there should be fees at all, and if they can't come to the conclusion that there aren't, that you consider not raising the fees at this time. Thank you again for your attention, your service, and for these long meetings that I don't know how you endure. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, if there are other members of the public who wish to speak during public hearing, now would be that time. I will look again on uh, again online and see if there are any if there's anyone with their hand raised. 
and it does not appear to be the case, nor does it in Contois. Um, so we will go to close the public hearing once, twice, and with that, we will close the public hearing. Um, my apologies uh, to the work for the Marketplace and Workforce Development Director, Kara al Nazwari, who I did not see was sitting behind the CAO. So my apologies, Kara. I, if there's anything that you wanted to add, um, or if you were just here to answer any questions, um, my apologies for not seeing you. Um, I do think it's probably worth just a quick comment since we have not raised the marketplace fee since 2016 or the FY17 um, budget cycle. Um, this is this uh, increase represents a 5% increase, which is less than a percent a year. Um, while I I, I do understand um, some of the comments that Mr. Sherman made. Uh, I am operating within the confines of the charter and the structure as I have inherited it, and I am uh, losing the battle against inflation at the moment. And uh, we need some upgraded maintenance vehicles and um, a few other items. And I am also looking to um, increase some of our capital reserves so we can address some deferred maintenance on the street as well. This increase represents a little over $30,000 overall for the year. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we will close the public hearing and move on to item 7.9, which is a resolution allocation method and standards for common area fee formula and establishment of common area fees for the Church Street Marketplace for fiscal year 2024. I will go to a motion from our, the sponsor of the resolution, Councilor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. Move to waive the reading and adopt the resolution. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Uh, seconded by, um, seconded by, Councillor Hightower. Oh, my apologies. Councillor Hightower, is there any discussion on this motion to waive the reading and adopt the resolution? Uh, Councillor Barlow. Councillor Hightower was ahead of me, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I had a question about the, um, the total amount of the increase. You said it's a total of 30000 for the for the entire marketplace? Yeah, it's slightly over 30000 I think it's 32 Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Now we'll go to Councillor Hightower. Um, yeah, just wondering what the general response was from folks on the marketplace, um, the businesses that would be paying. I did not get a response. Okay. Um, they were notified multiple times, as well as um, when the commission voted. The commission took two months, two separate commission meetings to deliberate the increase. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Uh, are there, Councillor Carpenter? This is, uh, you can probably explain to, I'm just curious, um, does all of this allocation method get sort of reconfigured after a city place gets built? I mean, is that, could be something you're gonna be looking at? Um, well, hopefully, yes. Okay. Right now, these fees are just assessed on the yeah. um, per square foot ground floor, mm -hmm. which includes a portion of the defunct mall yeah. at the moment um, that is still being paid by the owners of that part. Um, and yes, there are many internal discussions and I believe a desire um, to discuss uh, looking at the downtown as a larger district um, with the thinking that Burlington's downtown is larger than four blocks and having this um, level of attention spent on it and maybe we could sort of um, broaden that scope um, to be able to bring more um, enhanced attention to the rest of the downtown. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, Councillor Hightower. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Follow-up question because I'm not sure that it, so the City Place is still paying, are they paying the same that they would have paid regardless if there's a building or not? Or no? Correct, because okay. that front structure, if it abuts the marketplace itself, 
up to a certain depth, it is still assessed. Great. Well, good to know we've got something that has progressive taxation, land-based tax in Burlington, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Hightower. Um, before we go to a vote, we'll go to Councillor uh, Councillor Travers. Uh, thanks, President Paul. Just briefly to note that uh, because of a professional conflict of interest, Councillor Doherty and I need to recuse ourselves from this vote. That is so noted that Councillors Doherty and Travers um, will not be voting on this item due to a conflict of interest, a professional conflict of interest. Um, with that, we'll go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion to waive the reading and adopt the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes 10, um, 10 to 0 with two recusals. Um, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for staying to this relatively late hour. Um, that moves us to the last item on our deliberative agenda. Um, and uh, that item is 7.10, which is a resolution accepting grant funding from the Department of Mental Health for the crisis response team and exploring the creation of a Burlington Cape Department. For this resolution, I will go to Councillor Carpenter. Um, thank you. Um, I would um, waive the reading of the resolution um, and move to adopt the re I would move to waive the reading and adopt the resolution and would ask the f for the floor back after a second. Thank you so much, Councillor Carpenter. Seconded by Councillor McGee. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, this is almost sort of a backwards written um, resolution because it's the last resolve where we accept the money um, for the CARES project, which is really um, such an exciting move and is the first in the series of um, programs and enhancements that we want to offer. And this really is to acknowledge that and suggest that we really need to look at this arm of public safety um, and what it's responsible for, how it's operated, where does it fit in city government. Um, we heard a lot tonight about our work um, with the house lists and and interactions with that. More of this work is being put directly on the city, um, and that brings with it oversight that we're not quite clear where it would be best suited. We've heard certainly the concerns um, of the drug addiction problem, and we have already um, Comstat. So this is to really ask us, let's look at that basket of um, activities which really does represent a third arm of public safety and see how it fits best and can be operated best in city government. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Councillor Carpenter. Uh, oh, and just one other oh. co comment, because Anna Wegling from who, the police department spoke and um, was updating us on, on their activities, and I just want to note that our first resolve clause um, asked that this evaluation be done um, including the public safety employees. So um, we need to take to heart what she had to say, and we will. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other counselors that wish to speak to this resolution? I know the hour is late. Um, it, is, it, it is an important resolution. I'm sorry that it went last on the agenda, but uh, certainly not, let, not to let the... Uh, the late hour lessen the sincerity and importance of the resolution. Um, if there are no counselors who wish to speak to this resolution, we will go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion to waive the reading and adopt the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. That completes our deliberative agenda. Um, but we do still have one item left, and that is uh, item number eight, which is committee reports. Um, are there counselors who wish to offer a committee report? Councillor Travers, and then we'll go to Councillor Jang. Well, I added committee reports to the motion largely because Councillor Bergman had um, 
giving us sort of a sneak peek to maybe Councillor Barlow talking about the uh, symposium there. So wanted to make sure you had that moment, Councillor Barlow. Uh, but um, the, uh, the, the Ordinance Committee will be meeting on June 12th um, to um, the mayor's point from earlier in the meeting, we will be, uh, this will be our third meeting to consider the proposed rezoning changes for the South End Innovation District. And the hope um, will be to potentially wrap up that discussion on the meeting on, on June 12th. Um, speaking in my role with Council Bergman as co-chair of the Committee on uh, Police Oversight and Accountability, we have meetings scheduled there on July 6th, July 13th, August 2nd, and August 3rd over the summer. Uh, so we'll look forward to the discussion continuing in those meetings. Thank you, Councilor Travers. We'll go to Councilor Jang and then to Councilor Barlow. Yep, um, the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee is meeting tomorrow <coughs> um, at 5.30, Busher Room, and the main agenda items are legal services being offered to BIPOC people in the city of Burlington, especially women of color. Um, we'll re receive a presentation from a local organization. We will also hear about the last fine tune of Juneteenth uh, for the city of Burlington. The last details will be presented to the committee. And um, um, also we will dig deeper into the restructuring of the REIB department. So those are the main three agenda items. And committee members include Grant, Councilor Grant, and Councilor Tarban. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll move on to Councillor Barlow and then to Councillor Bergman. With, with the big tease all night about the, bi the biomass symposium. <laughs> so um, anyways, I don't know who's paying attention still, but for those who are, um, the burning of biomass for electricity generation at McNeil Station is a topic that has uh, recently received the attention of the, the Vermont Climate Council and one that has generated significant public interest. Some have questioned the renewable status of biomass and call for a plan to phase out or close McNeil. Others argue that McNeil is our best option for reducing fossil fuel use and is a sustainable alternative. Um, this is a relevant topic for us because we're going to be considering a district energy plan um, later this summer. The TUC is holding a symposium on Tuesday, June 13th at 6.30 p.m. here in this room uh, to address questions related to the biomass burning at McNeil. We'll have a panel of experts to answer questions that Tatuk has prepared, as well as questions we are soliciting from the public. Look, look for more for this, look for more on this, it's late here, isn't it? Um, over the next two days on Front Porch Forum and on the web webpage and on social media. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Councillor Barlow. Uh, Councillor Bergman. Uh, we've got a tax abatement organizational meeting happening on Thursday, this coming Thursday at 4.30. I don't expect it to be long, but the idea is as a quasi-judicial hearing body, we'll take the time to figure out exactly how we do it right so that when it comes here, it's done right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I did want to also mention uh, that, not that it's a standing committee, but we do have a special committee that we form every year for boards and commissions to nominate people to serve on boards and commissions. Um, by, uh, by our rules, um, the members of that committee, the board and commissions nominating committee, are four city councilors and a, a representative from the administration. Um, I would very much like to thank um, Councillors Grant, Bergman, Shannon, and King for offering to serve on this committee, and not only for offering to serve on this committee, but all agreeing to a committee meeting date, um, which is coming up very soon. It's this, it will be the 7th of June. I believe it's at 530. Um, they have received um, information on those applicants. Um, and the four of you and a representative of the administration will meet, um, uh, select a chair, and then the five of you can take it from there as far as how you wish to proceed and um, interviews that you wish to conduct. And of course, the goal is to find um, a consensus building approach to uh, uh, hopefully 
finding agreement on all of the seats that are available for the coming fiscal year. So thank you again for your willingness to serve. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Um, with that, and hearing no, uh, Councillor Grant? I just wanted to remark that it's been freezing in here this <laughs> evening. And if we could do anything to have the temperature adjusted in the future, uh, I don't, I'm, we're right under like blowing cold air. And I'm so, I'm yeah, sorry. if anyone I'm wants sorry. to switch seats, but it is freezing. <laughs> I am sorry. I am sorry that you waited until 1130 to let us know. We might have been able to do something, but we will keep that in mind. Duly. Duly, duly noted. It has been cold. It has been cold. Okay. All right. Um, I, uh, I, I appreciate and hope that for those, for those probably few people that are watching the end of our meeting, that they will see that we really are the collaborative body that we say we are. Um, Thank you all so much. Um, I should make. I should ask for a motion to adjourn. So, if someone would make a motion to adjourn, so moved. So moved by Count Councillor McGee and seconded by Councillor Hightower. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed, please say no. Uh, we are adjourned, and our next meeting is the twentieth of June. Happy Juneteenth and enjoy the next few weeks. Good night.